Hi everyone, welcome to our Wednesday night movie session. And I always say this, but really, I really, really mean it tonight. This is, you are in for a major treat because uh, we are w going way, way down the rabbit hole. We're going all the way through the, through the bottom today. And, um, and we're going to do it with a quantum movie. I say that, you know, sometimes people watch these movies on the big screen or, or they watch them on Netflix or on the internet. And um, this, this was another movie that, that didn't really do too well at the box office because it's way past the consciousness of, of the planet. <laughs> but it's perfect for us because this is the kind of thing that you want in your spiritual toolbox for uh, saving thousands and thousands of years. If you really are not a fan of reincarnation and you don't really plan on coming back again for another go-round, this is the kind of movie that's like, you'll be like, oh, you're licking your chops uh, because it's a quantum movie. In fact, you know, I've been talking about uh, quantum thinking and quantum forgiveness for some, some years now. It's been years since the book Quantum Forgiveness was uh, published. But um, just like in science, you know, at the turn of the century in the early 1900s when we had our Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein and, and we had our beginning quantum physicists, our quantum scientists, that basically overturned centuries and centuries of science, you know, all the way back to Galileo and Descartes and, and all of the, the previous uh, early days of science. Uh, Isaac Newton probably was the most famous, so that's why we call him Newtonian science and Newtonian physics. And then, then when quantum came, it completely overturned what was before it. So, now that some of you have been following on these movies, you can see every week the movies are building and building and then the last monthly online retreat we did was called Beyond the Body. So we, we took Mr. Nobody and it was such a deep movie and it was such a deep experience that I kept getting messages sent to me days after we showed the, the movie over the weekend in two parts and people were having these huge insights that were coming unexpectedly in their mind out of the light, like these huge insights that they were like, oh my God, David, this changes everything. I just realized, da 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 da, from me showing uh, with, with lots of explanation uh, and commentary, a quantum movie. Well, tonight we're going to show another quantum movie. If you go in the movie theater and, and you watch this, um, there's a pretty good chance you'll come out of the theater scratching your head. Uh, but that's the same with Mr. Nobody. If you would watch Mr. Nobody without commentary, it's a pretty good chance you'd just scratch your head. Like, I don't even know, I don't know what that was. Um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind is kind of moving towards quantum, and then this movie tonight and Mr. Nobody, pure quantum. The difference between Mr. Nobody and the movie we're going to see tonight is that Mr. Nobody spans a time frame of time of, of 118 years. Tonight's movie will span a thousand years in linear time. And believe me, if you get what I'm going to be talking about tonight, if you experience it and feel it, it will save you thousands of years in terms of reincarnation. Boom, 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 boom. It will collapse the Alpha and the Omega in a hugely rapid way. In fact, you may be a little dazed and dazzled. You might be, unless that movie, bedazzled. Except this is the Holy Spirit bedazzling your mind instead of uh, the devil. And bedazzled, it was, uh, it was the devil. But here it's the Holy Spirit, and this is going to really collapse things. So we have, we have it's a relationship movie. The relationships kind of span 1,000 years from back in 1500 Spain, back in the days of the Spanish Inquisition and the conquistadors, conquistadors. and then we zoom to 2000, and then we have uh, a very surreal 2500, 
I mean, it's, it's pretty spacey. It's like you're off in space. <laughs> it's like you're way, way out there in space in, in the year, in the year 2500. Uh, it's, it's not, nothing like Earth uh, and the scenes of Earth um, in 2000. The two main characters, it's a relationship movie, again, just like Mr. Nobody, except um, in Mr. Nobody, uh, Neo, N Nemo, Nobody had three different relationship scenarios playing out. Wasn't it Jean, and Anna, and Elise? Yeah. This one, it's the same characters, but back in the 1500s, um, it's going to be the queen and her conquistador, and then in 2000 it's going to be Izzy, and it's going to be Tommy, which I was telling everybody in the studio, Izzy is a beautiful name because it's, it's, it refers to isness. Um, you know how it says in the workbook of A Course in Miracles, we say God is, and we cease to speak. This is Izzy. This is, she's coming off of the isness, and she, this is Izzy. And Izzy, when you watch this movie, she will rep, represent the Holy Spirit's thought system. She will represent that this whole cosmos is holographic, that it's all a projection, and, and you might say the whole is, is in every part. It's possible to see the wholeness of the real world in every part, when, you, when your mind is released from the fragmentation, then you can see that it's all holographic. Also, she's going to talk about wholeness, she's going to talk about surrender, she's going to talk about acceptance, she's talking about grace. She is our Holy Spirit character because she represents a way of thinking, a holistic way of thinking, which is what the Holy Spirit's thought system is. So when you watch this, instead of trying to follow it in a linear way, when Izzy's on the screen, she's, she's going to be representing this healed perception, a healed way of looking at the world and surrendering going in. Here comes our cat, Iso. She's the Iso. Izzy is the Iso in this movie. Um, she's, 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 not into the things of the world, she's into the present moment, she's into playfulness, she's into relaxation, she's into enjoyment, and her husband, Tommy, Doubting Thomas, uh, the reason he's Doubting Thomas is because he's into analysis, he's into the medical model, he's into looking for external cures, uh, desperately trying to save his wife by finding a miracle cure, a, a cure. So, from Course in Miracles terms, there's nothing evil about uh, medicine or the medical model. Jesus never refers to anything as evil, but he would say it's, it's magical. And the reason it's magical is because in order for something to be magic, you have to give healing belief to something external. You know, a lot of times people talk about medicine or aspirin or different types of uh, medication. Even if you're doing Reiki on somebody and you're trying to work on various body parts with the Reiki, it's still magical because you're still trying to apply spiritual energy and spiritual principles onto specific things. And the whole course is teaching, no, bring, bring your specific problems back to the Holy Spirit in your mind and they'll disappear. Bring all your beliefs in specific illnesses, diseases, bring them to the Holy Spirit, and equally all of those diseases will disappear because they all have the same cause, and that's the ego. And the Holy Spirit overlooks the ego, so therefore it takes care of all the specific diseases and illnesses of, of time and space that seem to get projected onto the body and the world. So. Wow, we are going quantum tonight with our main two characters, a married couple, one who represents the, the, uh, the Holy Spirit's way of thinking, one Tommy representing the egos, and, and this tends to put 
Tommy into a position where he believes he personally has to do something for, back in the 1500s, for his, his queen. Basically, his queen is saying, do you love me? Yes, I do, Madam Queen. Okay, save Spain for me. One small request, save Spain. <laughs> and so he's going to do everything that he can to save Spain. Then, in 2000, it's Izzy that seems to have uh, an, an illness or a disease that's kind of taking over her body. And so she's losing her vitality, her energy. And then he's like a researcher, a doctor, and he's trying to use his genius skills to come up with the vaccine. That's what's kind of what's going on on planet Earth now. We've got all these scientists and doctors and nurses in all these countries that are scurrying around to try to find the vaccine, and they're going nuts. Actually, they're, it's very stressful when, when you perceive that there's a virus, an invisible virus going around the planet that's wreaking havoc, havoc and you have to come up with the vaccine. In fact, I, I was just reading today that they so much want the vaccine in all the countries, there's, there's almost like a competition for who can come up with the vaccine and will they share the vaccine with other countries, whoever comes up with the winner. And then I heard today that in the United States they have an agency called FDA, Food and Drug Administration, and they so much want a vaccine that they're ready to put a vaccine as soon as one comes that looks promising, they're going to put it on the market without proper testing. So, so watch out for the vaccines. You know, it could be a quick one coming through, but you might be the guinea pig. Uh, at least the body might be the guinea pig, <laughs> the trial thing. Because it's all, it's a pressure situation. It's rush, rush, rush. It's perceived to be an external virus or pandemic. And then it's looking for a medical cure, which Jesus says is not evil. It's just, it's just magical. You know, you made up an unreal world, and then you're now you're trying to solve it with unreal means. And Jesus says that's what magic's all about, using external means. What is external means? Something, something besides your mind is basically what external is. Anything besides your mind, anything besides looking at your own thoughts, anything besides looking at your own beliefs. Jesus says of all of the reasons for this upset and the suffering that you experience, of all the reasons you believe it's happening, and all the causes you believe it's happening, he says the one thing that you have overlooked, the one thing you could not admit, was the, the cause of all these uh, sufferings and upsets, was your own guilt, he says. And that is this unconscious guilt I've been talking about for weeks, the dream you dream in secret. The unconscious guilt is the source of all perceived upsets and all perceived diseases. And I say source, but I'll put quotes around that because it's not a real source. Why isn't it a real source? Because God didn't create guilt. <laughs> God didn't create the ego. God did not create the unconscious mind. That's why it's a, it's, a, it's a source in the sense that it's what's producing all of these unreal effects and all these unreal upsets. It's, it's the guilt in the mind. Now this movie is going right after that one. It's, Jesus is saying, you have, a, you have a little gap in your mind and then this tiny little gap that's where the whole cosmos is, of time and space. Out of the vast, vast, vast mind that you have, that God created, you've got a little pimple. You've got a little, what do they call those, blackheads? <laughs> if we're using a skin analogy, you've got a little blackhead. You've got a little tiny dot, a little tiny spot in your mind, and he calls it a gap. You've got a tiny little gap. That sounds almost like going to the dentist, too. Got a gap. <laughs> when I was in, in England, I used to ride the tubes and I'd hear this speaker come on, mind the gap. Ooh. Then every time the doors would open, I'd hear, mind the gap. 
I was excited. I thought, the British are onto it. They, they gave us 007 and Q and M, and now they know, they know about the gap. They know about the gap. Mind the gap. That's what Jesus is, keeps saying. Mind the gap. You're distracting through centuries. You're distracting through millennium. You don't realize where the error is. It's the gap. It's the unholy instant, he calls it in your mind, where you believe the separation occurred. And the only way you are free to experience eternity is you have to see the nothingness of this gap. If you can look with the Holy Spirit on the gap and see its nothingness, the black head is popped, the pimple is popped. I've never heard Jesus use that analogy, but the pimple is popped if you can look with the Holy Spirit on this gap. Now what this movie I like is, is because we're going to see a thousand years with different symbology and images from over these thousand years, from 1500 to 2500. And all of them are just effects. So that's why I'll tell you at the beginning, don't try to follow this movie, you know, if we get halfway through this movie and, or we get to the end of the movie and you, Eric says, okay, raise your hands. And the first question is, I didn't get the plot. Of course you didn't get the plot. The, there is no plot in this movie. <laughs> You're going to be watching a plotless movie. So that's why it takes a lot of faith. But don't ask at the end of the movie what the plot is because, or, or don't ask, what does it mean? You're supposed to tell me <laughs> at the end of this movie with your euphoric joy. That's what I want to hear, is what you experience beyond watching a movie in a linear way where you're, you're trying to figure out the plot. But the, we're trained to do that. Every time we watch a movie, we always, we, we feel like in order for us to enjoy the movie, we have to get into the plot. Get, there's that word again, get. We have to get the plot to enjoy the movie. Don't try to get the plot on this one. I'll tell you, you'll go nuts if you try to get the plot. But I want you to go into the place of giving in your mind where you can go into this holy instant, this joy, where you have all the answers and you are the answer. And your state of mind is the answer. And that's the ha ha ha. That's the joy, the joyful part of what this is all about. We're just going into an experience together using this movie. The movie is titled The Fountain. And The Fountain, it's got Hugh Jackman, which is good because he's, you know, he plays Wolverine and X-Men, you know, he's, he's a good conquistador. He's going to, supposed to save Spain for his queen. And Henry, Hugh Jackman can play that part, well, like Wolverine. He's, he's strong and, you know, he'll do whatever. He's brave, he's, he's all the things you want from a conquistador. Except remember, Hugh is playing the ego thought system. And what is a conquistador? Does anybody know what a conquistador is? It's a conqueror, is what a conquistador is. It's a conqueror. And, and you can tell that's not the Holy Spirit's uh, thought system. The Holy Spirit is not a conqueror. The Holy Spirit doesn't come into your mind and go, where are those ego thoughts? I'm going to zap them. I'm going to go on a search and destroy mission. Psst, 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 psst. No, it's not how it works. The Holy Spirit does not go on a search and destroy mission because the Holy Spirit is not a conqueror. The Holy Spirit is this beautiful light Forgiveness is quiet and silently does nothing. It looks and waits and judges not. Does that sound like the light? That's passive. Quietly does nothing. It looks and watches and waits and does nothing. Quietly does nothing. That means it just shines and its purpose is to shine away the darkness. When you voluntarily bring the darkness to the light, that's how it gets shined away. But the Holy Spirit is not battling the ego, nor is he going on a search and destroy mission. So the Holy Spirit is not a conqueror. Going back to the theme of transparency, a lot of times what we work on, and we have worked on for years, was expression sessions. Say what you need to say, don't hide it, don't protect it. And that's the first step in opening to true transparency. But 
That actually is not the transparency. Hopefully you will, with your mighty companions, you will reach a point where you reach the end of your expression sessions. Talking about ego darkness and expressing it is just a symbolic of your willingness to not hide and protect anything from the light. But then you should reach a point in your mind training where you actually get activated and you get lit up and then you start to realize, oh my gosh, the transparency had nothing to do with dropping the mask. Dropping the mask was the preliminaries. It's the preschool. That's not what the transparency was out about. The transparency is about shining the light, letting the light shine through you and express through you. Using the body for, uh, like Jesus says, the one use of the body is to let the Holy Spirit, let the voice for God speak through it. He says that's the one right use of, of the body. And that would be like letting the light shine through you. So that's why we talk so much about being done through, we talk about function, we talk about uh, stepping into your purpose and getting clear in your mind of your purpose. And this movie will help with that because again, T Tommy and Izzy represent the two different thought systems. Basically, the thought system that Tommy represents cannot be integrated with the Holy Spirit's thought system. The darkness and the light don't ever integrate. One is real, the light, one is unreal, and you don't ever integrate the real with the unreal. What you do is when you heal by not hiding and protecting the darkness, your mind integrates and then you realize that the darkness is no more and really never was. So the integration means integrity in the mind, which is just another way of talking about the light. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because if you can begin to face these two thought systems that are in the mind, not from a place of dissociation, which is a, trying to keep both of them in your mind, uh, keeping them both, so to speak, alive. That's what dissociation is. It's a psychological term. And that's where you try to keep two irreconcilable thought systems, both active in your mind, fear and love. That's a split mind. It's, it's psychosis, it's schizophrenic, it's, it, 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 it's confusion, it's doubt, there will be no happiness, there's no completion to be found in this maneuver. And yet, if you choose to end the dissociation, then you will bring the darkness to the light and the darkness will disappear and only light remains. That's what this movie is about. It's, it's not a literal interpretation of a literal relationship or it's not a really a reincarnation movie where you get to see, okay, a, the couple, the queen and the conquistador in the 1500, then you get to see them in the 2000, and you get to see them in, in uh, 2500. It's not like that. It's actually showing you so clearly these two different thought systems that in the end, you can have the realization that they can't both be true. And that's what spiritual enlightenment's about. It's coming to the realization that, of what's real and what's true. Or as Jesus says, the truth is true and only the truth is true. That's his way of describing a whole integrated mind. The truth is true and only the truth is true. So when you watch this movie, it's possible just to watch your thoughts and you will also see that from the thought system that's reflected in Tommy, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of frustration, there's a lot of doubt, there's heartbreak, there's pain, um, there's a sense of longing, there's grief, there's, there's a sense of missing, uh, you get all that. It's all acted out in Tommy. It uh, doesn't matter what century he seems to be in. 
He's, he will be acting that out until the point comes of release, which is really our own mind. It can't be that we're just watching a bunch of characters on the screen. This has to be for us. So it's all, and, and of course with Izzy, she's just shining her isness even through what seems to be physical symptoms. She still has this sense of grace. She still has this sense of relaxation. She is not putting really faith in the physical, even what seems to be a physical illness. Um, she She's developing stronger and stronger trust as the movie goes along. Uh, even in this 2000 scenario where she seems to be the one that, that has the symptoms. Because she's moving into a place of surrender. And I think you've noticed anybody who has dealt with the, with the perception of sickness and disease and illness, that you always know that you have a point of surrender in your mind where you can let go of taking it seriously. Jesus doesn't take it seriously, you know, the, Jesus doesn't take seriously the projection of guilt because he knows the guilt's not real and neither is the projection. So Jesus isn't losing any, uh, any sleep. Well, not that he sleeps, that's not a good metaphor. <laughs> Jesus is not concerned about symptoms. In fact, Jesus says in the Course, don't ask the Holy Spirit to heal the body, he says in the Course. Ask the Holy Spirit to heal your perception of the body. So, Jesus is teaching us that, that clearly we all need to mind the gap. We all need to really take a close, honest look at this gap with, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit to see the nothingness of the gap. Because as long as you believe the gap is real, then you're going to be dealing with, for some time, a perception of an external world that is very, very confusing and, and, and seems to make no sense. And to the extent that you try to figure it out or understand this projection, you'll feel crazy. Uh, philosophers have been trying to figure this projection out for many years. Psychologists have taken their shot at figuring it out. Freud, you know, id and ego and superego and the unconscious, he took his shot. And, and, and now we've even got transpersonal psychologists nowadays who are taking their shot. But, but there is no way to understand the meaningless. I remember one time where I was asking Jesus about the world of perception and he, he called it, he said the world is an impossible situation. How's that for a label on the world of what? What did you say? An impossible situation. He said, yeah, you're perceiving an impossible situation. And the only way to get out of an impossible situation, Jesus tells us in the Course, is to realize you were never in it. How's that for an amazing mind? That's what Jesus says. It's the world's an impossible situation and the only way to escape it is to realize you were never in it. Well, if I was never in it, maybe I was the light. Yes, yes. If I'm the light, then he says, that's right, that means you are everywhere and everything. You have absolutely no limit. There is no such thing as time and space limiting your identity into a location. And yet, all human beings have the belief that they were born in such and such a year, and they lived for X amount of years, and then they will die at a, a point in time. All human beings believe that the cosmos is a, is a vast projection of, they don't call it projection, but it's a vast uh, time-space coordinate thing, and every human being has, has a location. When people say, where, on the phone, where are you now? And you say, Mexico, or Utah, or New York, or wherever, you're giving a general location, and they say, where? Where in Mexico? Where in New York? Where in Utah? And then you give it more specific. Okay, 
What, what address? What's your address? It's like your, where your phone is, is like an IP address. The CIA and the FBI know exactly where your body is. <laughs> it's, it's called a, a, a location, a, a geometric location. But scientists do this with all kinds of particles. But this is not how the light is. The light is everywhere and everything. So that shows you how different the light is from the perception of this world. It has no location. I remember years, I, I was in the course for years and years and years and I'm doing my workbook lessons, I'm studying the course and my biological father, he, he did not like his perception of me reading, studying, meditating, praying all day long. He used to sometimes refer to me as dirty, rotten, no good, bum, get a job. That, that was my long version instead of David. It was dirty, rotten, no good, bum, get a job. It was a long name. But from his perception, I was just taking up space and I wasn't doing anything productive. From my perception, I was trying to release my mind from the confines of time and space. So you see there was a little different perspective there. But what it came down to in the end was we did finally merge in the, in the light. Uh, after many, many years, we had a glorious merge experience of recognition, where I recognized him, he recognized me. I recognized that, that the form of him and the, the role of father and all that was made up. And he recognized the role of son and the dirty, no good, rotten bum was all made up. And we, yes, yes, we got it. We, we popped through, we got past the gap. The, that crazy gap in our mind, we were able to reach the joy and the happiness of seeing, oh my gosh, we're the same one, we're the same one, we're the same spirit. And that's what this movie is really about, ultimately, is, is coming to that place of integration and, and wholeness and recognition in the mind. Because that's, that's the only way that you can experience it, is an experience in mind. So, it's going to be a lively trip. Uh, sometimes I say, hold on to your hat, because Kansas is going bye-bye. This is a quantum movie, so if you really stay there, just watch your emotions during this movie. Don't try to figure out the plot. Um, it's going to be confusing if, by the end of the movie, if you're saying, David, now what is the plot? I say, no, 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 that's not the point of the movie. This movie doesn't have a plot. But it does have, it does offer a, a huge uh, healing, awakening experience if we're, if we're ready to receive it. So enjoy. I'll pop in from time to time. Enjoy. Okay, so now we've jumped to 2500 uh, in the future. He, he's in 2500, he's, he's levitating. He's not meditating on the ground, he's levitating out in space somewhere. This is our 2500 man. And he's having a past life memory of uh, from 1500s of a thousand years before, which is basically, um, he's, he's trying to approach, he goes through all the, the pagans, he climbs the steps, he gets there, and then he's got this warrior guarding the tree of life. What is the tree of life except for eternal life? And, and yet, if you believe you have to get past a, a guardian, it must be that this guardian is in your own mind. The light is not keeping you from anything. It must be that there's a block in your mind that, that has put the, the concept of like a warrior, the image of a warrior, with a flaming sword that you have to get past in order to go to the tree of life. So, the tree of life, if we think of that as the light of God and the light of, of oneness, then Jesus gave us the key, he gave us the gateway 2,000 years ago when he said, Blessed are the pure of heart, 
for they shall see God. So what Jesus was giving us, he was giving us the key to eternal life. You have to have a pure heart in order to, to see God, in order to see the light, in order to, to experience the light, in order to experience yourself as light, as a creation of light. You have to have a pure heart. And that pure heart has to be a heart of devotion to the light because if you're not devoted solely to the light, you know, let thine eye be single. If your eye isn't single, if, if your devotion isn't single, then your devotion is split and part of your devotion goes on to this little gap in the mind. And this little gap is the ego. And all of time and space is, is within this one gap. It's all just one instant. All of millions and millions and millions of years is just all within this tiny gap. And it's all just one instant. It's really not many instants. Like he says, history would not exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present. So you might say the whole Groundhog Day loop, the whole loop of time and space and what seems to be linear time is all just in the gap. But if you don't go toward that gap with the light to, to pass that gap, then all it seems is you just seem to reincarnate over and over and go through seemingly endless numbers of scenarios and experiences in time and space. So he's, he's meditating in the, in the in the sky, we'll say. He's, in, he's, in, he's levitating and meditating and somewhere off in 2500 and he's had a past memory come up of, of his days of conquistador and his days of, um, for the queen, he's got the, the, he's got the ring. He's got the ring. That's kind of back in the days of 1500, that was like getting married when you're serving your queen. Uh, and you'll do anything to protect the queen, protect Spain, you know, make sure that Spain continues on. That's, that was his marriage vow back in the 1500s, and now he's married. We haven't seen Izzy yet in 2000, and now we're getting a flash forward into his 2500 self, who's levitating and meditating, and still, even though he can levitate in the middle of the sky, He's still dealing with the same gap <laughs> that he had, he was facing back in the 1500s with the Queen. It's the same gap. He still wants to find eternal life. Isn't that what everybody's looking for? Salvation, eternal life, you know, not to die. Uh, that's, that's what Jesus was teaching. He was teaching everything he taught was about eternal life, finding, experiencing the Kingdom of Heaven. And he's just facing a memory now. So I want you to just, when you see that guy in the headdress and, and you see that flaming sword, just realize that that's just a, a belief in the mind. That, that is just a character that's coming from the gap to protect the gap. Because if you get past that character and you get past the gap, then it's only light. So that's the whole point of the spiritual journey, is to first mind the gap and then <laughs> transcend the gap with the help of the Holy Spirit. So that gives you just a little bit of context so you're not lost out of the, out of the gate. <laughs> like, what the hell is, is the guy meditating in, in the air? You know, that's what it, it's, it's just his future self, uh, that he's still meditating, he's still trying to meditate his way back to God. And uh, this movie, Jesus, is going to give us a little shortcut. Okay. So in his future self, you can see he's there. He, he's uh, astral projecting around in the sky, and he comes down to the tree, and he comes up very carefully and just takes a little teeny piece of bark. And, and if you notice, he, used the word, he uses the word take. I'll just take a little. Think about that word take, you know, with all the movies we've been doing about the getting, the getting mechanism. Here he is in 2500, and I'll just take a little. And he, he eats it. He puts the bark in his mouth. 
so he's he it doesn't require much I'll just take a little but he's still in the he's representing the take mentality in in the year 2500 it's still there and then Izzy whoosh shows up and she sits smiling and she's like take a walk with me you see even there when he's just trying to just take a little and he's still in the taking she's there take a walk with me with a big smile on her face then it flashes back to 2000 and she's saying take a walk with me and he's a workaholic he basically he can't take time out uh, to go for a walk with his wife because he has so much work to do he's so busy this is the greatest distraction in spirituality is you think you have to work it out on your own this is the human approach to spirituality that I personally if I practice enough if I do enough practice enough Hail Marys enough yoga postures enough hours sitting in meditation enough of something and yet in the even in the Bible it says it's not through works alone it's by grace that you know God it's through grace it's through grace it's not through works so that's why we've done I don't know a number of retreats on undoing the doer I think there's at least three different ones on on YouTube but that's because it's a state of mind it's a shift in your perception it's a shift in your purpose in mind from one of getting to giving from one of taking to extending from one of what is it going to cost me to what can I give you know those two purposes are are everything and the gap is the take mentality it is the get mentality it is the the achieve mentality it's the work it out mentality it's the fix it mentality if you get nothing else from this movie if you just start to identify this in your in your mind it will save you so much time because time was made to cover over this choice of purpose the atonement is just the giving motive that's that's buried in the mind and to the extent you can get into giving without limits to have give all to all to giving if you get into such a giving attitude that when you wake up in the morning and you think I have a wow I have a whole another day before me to give and only to give and you have no thought whatsoever about getting or taking anything another way to say it is the reason that the time seems to move forward like the world believes the time goes forward past present future it doesn't Jesus tells us it actually goes backwards and and he says in the course that time goes backwards and once you reach its origin it will roll up like a carpet isn't that an interesting metaphor Jesus uses in the course it will roll up like a carpet backwards when you reach the origin of it when you get down to that gap in the mind which is producing the whole time space illusion all of time rolls up like a carpet and then you start to realize that well why was why did it seem to be going forward if it was going backwards that's amazing I swore it was going forward and now you're telling me it's going backwards is because when you try to take anything from this world when you try to get any result when you try to get an outcome when you're trying to get anything at all from the world you're adding something that doesn't belong there and when you stop trying to get from this world when you cease to demand anything from this world when you love makes no demands when you reach a point where you are not making any demands and you do not desire to get anything from this world that's going to pull that thread of getting out from the script and suddenly you realize that that time never did go forward it was just a trick to think that time was moving in a forward motion but it's really not that at all 
It's only the getting, taking motive that makes it seem as if it moves forward. So basically Jesus says in the Course, it's more like you, you're retracing your steps. Like remember, does everyone know the foot, footprints in the sand story, you know, where you're walking along and then um, there's, there's two sets of footprints and then suddenly there's only one set of footprints and the ego goes, Jesus, where were you when I needed you the most? I'm walking, that's just one set of footprints there. Uh, and Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, that I'm carrying you. That's me carrying you. <laughs> you see, the, that's a little bit different perspective. Jesus is like, oh yeah, I was right there all along. You interpreted <laughs> that I was gone because there's only one set of footprints. But I was carrying you. He was carrying you the rest of the way back to eternity. He was taking you back past the gap. And he, you weren't alone ever. He was literally carrying you. Your personhood was lifted off the, the sand for those final steps. And Jesus says God will take the final step. Because God's step is really a, is creation. It's heaven. It's not really a step at all, the way we think of steps. But, but it's, it's actually, once you've forgiven, once you give up the gap, then, then God says, ah, oh, here we are where we've always been in heaven, and you never went anywhere. You just had, it's like this dream thing. God doesn't even know the dream, so that's why God takes the final step, because God doesn't come into the dream. The dream is the gap, and God doesn't know of gaps. God is eternal. Christ is eternal. So it's just important to just notice, even early on here with this movie, how even 2,500 in the year 2500, he's still using a little shovel thing and he's still scraping a little bit of bark. And he doesn't need much. He's able to move his body around <laughs> through time and space, but he's still taking. That's what I want you to notice. Because I told you that, that this Tommy is representing the ego's thought system and the ego is always taking. It doesn't even know what giving is. It's always taking. And you can get that lesson right now. You don't have to wait till the year 2500. You can get it right now. You can get it on your couch tonight. Uh, if, you, if you can really see that purpose is the only choice, that, that that's the one thing you really have a choice on, of whether you're going to be a giver or a taker, then if that will make everything change in, in your whole perception of the world. You will never look at the world the same way. You will never see the same world. If, you, if you're a giver. We know that Jesus was a giver. And we know that God is a giver. And so we should know intuitively that we must be a giver too. <laughs> that was a movie we watched too, right? The Giver. <laughs> we, we're getting it from every angle. <laughs> but now we're getting it in a, in a quantum movie over a thousand years to try to help us out to get the one lesson. Okay, here we go. So, Izzy keeps inviting him, inviting him, take a walk with me. Some of the, you remember there's that beautiful Christian song, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. It's like Jesus keeps calling us to take a walk with him. And we're always too busy. We've got too many earth things to deal with to take a walk with Jesus. And yet Izzy's like, take a walk with me, I can't. I can't, he says. I'm too busy. And then we see Izzy disappears and then the scientist comes and says, oh, come on, got to come. Come to the lab. Come to the lab. And that's the temptations of the world. What was our, one of our big themes was about um, distractions, attentiveness. Are we going to be attentive to the calling of our heart to take a walk with Jesus and go, it even looked like a bright cross. It looked like a cross of light when Izzy went through that door into the light. She said, it's the first snow. Everyone knows how it feels when it's the first snow. It's so soft and white and light and innocent. And, and she's saying, come on, it's the first snow. Like a child, come and take a walk with me. If, let's enjoy the moment. Let's enjoy our love. 
That's what our marriage is about. It's about love, it's about connectedness, it's about intimacy, it's about joy. Come take a walk with me. And he is preoccupied at trying to save Izzy. Because as, a, as identified as a scientist, he perceives that she has an illness and he needs to find the cure. That's what's happening on Earth right now. It's, it's, it's a frenetic search for for a, a cure for the COVID-19, for some kind of immunization, for some kind of, some kind of vaccine. It's a frenetic, they're spending billions of dollars, probably it'll get up into the trillions of searching for the vaccine. And then Jesus is saying what, there's Izzy, is, isness, speaking, come take a walk with me, come into the light with me. Don't be focused on the distractions of time and space which the ego made. Come into the light. I talked recently during the Mr. Nobody uh, movie and I said the ego made up linear time, past, present, future. And then I used an interesting phrase that Jesus uses in the Course where he says the ego tries to force continuity onto past, present, and future. That's why there's such a lack of attentiveness on the holy instant. That's why it seems human beings have a difficult time meditating. That's why people say, oh David, I can't still my mind. It's just like a monkey mind. It's yip, 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 yip. It's incessant. It's just going all day long and all night long. Yip, 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 yip. It's just yapping away. Well, it's because there's a fear to look within. Because Twofold. There's a fear to look within because, first of all, if you look within, there's a fear is the darkness. Even Vipassana meditators, which are like our, we'll call them our meditating experts, they don't meditate for a couple minutes or a few hours in a posture. These Vipassana meditators go for many, many hours. They go for weeks. They go for sometimes for months of meditation. They're like the primo meditators on the planet. And what do they say? They say that when they go into deeper and deeper states of mind, they reach a point of terror. That's what the Vipassana meditators are telling us. When they get deep enough into the stillness, they reach, it's like a wall of fear. I've heard them describe it, a wall of fear. That's why your average Sally, your average Joe, is afraid of meditating. Because, oh, if I drop, 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 what am I going to find? You know, it's the equivalent of the boogeyman. It's the equivalent of Freddy Krueger. Nightmare on Elm Street. It's nightmare on sleeping mind. It's nightmare on unconscious mind time. And the, and the Vipassana meditators have gone there. And they share their notes with each other. Like, did you hit that wall of fear? Yeah. Wasn't that amazing? I didn't think I'd find that. I thought I'd find bliss. And I hit, woo. That's why we need Jesus. We really, we really need Jesus if we're going all the way back to eternal life because he's gone past that wall of fear. He knows it's not even real. Wouldn't you want to have an advisor in your mind who knows it's not real, who can help you navigate past that wall of fear? You know, so when we talk about the fear to look within, which was the number one and the number two spots, depending on our English pole and our Spanish pole. But the fear to look within, first of all, there's a fear of the, of the terror, of the gap. When you get close to this gap um, in your mind, you, you really need to have good guidance because Jesus describes four obstacles to peace and then you go number one, number two, number three, and then it's, it's the fear of death and the, and the fear of God's love. It's, when you get down near that gap, the ego will be screaming like you never heard it scream before. It, Jesus says, you swore in blood you would never lift that cornerstone of that little gap. You swore in blood that you would never lift it. Because the ego is saying, if you lift that cornerstone, if you go into that gap, God will kill you. And his ego is saying, well, you split from God. You don't think God's just going to let you separate from God without a consequence. 
So that's where the fear of punishment comes in, that's where the guilt comes in, that's where the anger comes in, it's all down there in that gap. And as you get close to it, like the Vipassana meditators, then the, the wall of fear, the ring of fear, Jesus says there's a ring of fear under this perceptual world. That's where you're going right at that gap. That's what's going to happen. Now, in this movie, you know, we haven't got to that point yet, except that he did go, in the 1500s, he did go, he was literally attacked by the pagans, and then they carried him to the tower, and then they encouraged him, go on up there, go on. <laughs> and he, being the brave soul he was, he, he climbed up, and there was the, the warrior waiting for him. The guardian of, the, of, of life was there with a sword. And that guardian is the belief in sacrifice. I mean, there, if you go down and you lift that cornerstone that Jesus is talking about in the Course, in the fourth obstacle, it's just light. There is no, there is no warrior there. You don't have to slay something to go back to eternal life. You just have to be willing to, to lift the, the lid, so to speak, lift the lid on it. And Jesus is preparing us with all the mind training to lift that lid, to realize, no, it doesn't cost you anything. Eternal life has no cost. But you can believe, if you believe the ego is real and you believe this world is real, then you can believe that there's a sacrifice required to go back to that light. And that's what the gap is. The gap is the belief in sacrifice. All of time and space is nothing more than a, than a projection of the belief in sacrifice. And there are many sincere Christians, and I'm sure you've met them on planet Earth, that will tell you that in order to have eternal life, you have to, uh, someone had to pay the price. And they say Jesus was the one. He had to play, a, it was a bloody mess on the cross. He had to be killed to appease God. That sounds kind of strange. I mean, I don't know if I'd want to spend eternity with a God who has a, an innocent one killed to get there. Uh, but you will meet thousands tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even the Pope Francis says you have to, you have to go through sacrifice to, to return to eternal life. But we're using this movie tonight to say, no, that's not true. That there is no sacrifice required. It's just that if you believe the world's real, then you believe it will cost you something in time and space. Something will be taken from you in time and space. What does the Holy Spirit say? You never had it in the first place. Well, wait a minute, I'm going to lose my body. What, you never had it in the first place? Well, I'm going to use my, lose my career. Yeah, but you never had it in the first place. I'm going to lose my wife, my husband. You never had a wife or a husband in the first place. In the first place is the I amness. It's the light. It's eternal life. And eternal life doesn't know of form. It's the ego that made up this whole time-space trap. And that's why whenever we try to take something from this world, or we expect something, oh, I expect my employer to pay me, I expect my wife to give me a back rub, I expect when I go to pay for my money at the takeout, I expect the food. You know, whenever you expect anything from this world, it's still part of the ego belief system trying to get something, and trying to keep you distracted, which is our second thing, what's in, in it? Lack of attentiveness. Lack of attentiveness to your devotion to God results, you know, in all kinds of fear. It, it, it's, it's a scramble. It's, it's, if there's lack of attentiveness on God, if God isn't your goal, then your goal must be distractions. Because that's the limit of what's available. God, remembering God or distractions. And you may have noticed, I sometimes call this world Distractionville. You may have noticed I, I use that word. Because if you, if you believe distraction is possible, wow, this world can, can offer you plenty of different forms of distraction. But that's why Jesus was teaching us, the Bible said, be still and know that I am God. Be still, be still. He's saying, 
come into the quiet, come into the silence, come into the presence of God, come into the grace of God. And, and Izzy's going to use the grace word too, because she's just this happy, smiling-faced, and it's starting off pretty easy. Come take a walk with me. If you're married and you've got all this work to do, and your wife or your husband, in this case your wife, comes and says, come take a walk with me, why wouldn't you go? What, this, isn't that the reason you got married in the first place, was for love? Wasn't it for connection? Wasn't it for sharing a, a, a common purpose of, of being, you know, of one mind? Isn't that what marriage is, is, is the desire to be of one mind, to serve the same Creator, to realize the same, we have the same source. We are the same one. You know, that's the, that's the whole meaning behind marriage. It's, 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 a, it's an opening to the one. So, he's getting a lot of memories. Even in the year 2500, you can see he's thinking a lot. He's got Izzy, a uh, memory of her laying in a bed, and he's getting memories, memory flashes of him, uh, I've got to work, I've got to work. And what is it that's so important that he can't take a walk with Izzy in the snow is because he's got to find, he personally has to find a cure for her disease. That is, if that isn't the biggest description of the ego, it believes in personal responsibility. Did any of you ever see uh, the Matrix movie? The, the trilogy? Do any of you see the second the second movie where actually Neo goes to the architect. The architect's all dressed in white. That should tell us something. And then the architect says, the, the problem is choice. Uh-huh. The problem is choice, because in heaven there's no choices. In perfect oneness there's no choices. So the architect says, the problem is choice. And then we see all these television screens with Neo acting out, that's the anomaly of all the ego emotions. He's screaming, he's shouting, he's cursing in all these different television screens, right next to the architect. And then the architect calmly says to him, you have a choice. The door to the right leads back to the source, and the door to the left leads back to Trinity and the Matrix. Well, if that isn't the most profound aspect of the whole trilogy, the door to the right leads to the Source, and the door to the left leads back to Trinity and the Matrix. That's what's going on in this movie. First, he's having memories of being a conquistador and a queen. Then he's having memories of being Tommy the scientist and married to Izzy. And then he's having, he's having an experience of being often some place in, in space uh, with his, his, you know, drinking his stuff and chipping away a little bit of bark and all this and that, and having memories of Izzy show up. And in all cases, it's the Matrix. And this movie is not going to end with there. It's, this, this movie is going to the door to the right, to the Source. Because the Source is God, and the Source is Light. And this world is a veil covering over the light. This world was made to take the place of light. This world is a substitute generated by the ego, this time-space construct generated by the ego to keep you from knowing who you are. And that's it, plain and simple. I know sometimes people read the Course and they go, well, you know, I can find some passages where clearly God knows about the world, or God invented the world. I say, Do you, are you reading the same book? Are you reading the same book? I mean, in the workbook, oh, my Siri is talking to me. She must be reading a different book. I'm telling you what the Course is saying. In the workbook of A Course in Miracles, it says, it says, the world was made as an attack upon God, a place where God could enter not. How clear does Jesus have to be? This is not some non-dual path where it's like, oh, God was bored with himself, or 
with itself or whatever, herself. And then, so God had to create time and space so God could experience God. What? What? That, that is just metaphysically, it's ridiculous. Why, if you're perfect love, why would you need to create time and space to know yourself? You already know yourself is perfect love. You, in fact, you know that love is all there is. You know there isn't an opposite to love. It's just love. Everything is love. The Beatles even, you know, all you need is love. Even the Beatles got that much right. They didn't, all you need is love and a little fear. All you need is love and a little fear. No, no, that's not the lyrics. That's not the lyrics. All you need is love, love. Love is all you need. And then love, that's how the song is. Love is all there is. Love is all, love is all you need. Love is all you need. Now, those are basic metaphysics. Anyone who tries to say, oh, God created the world to be Leela because God was bored and God needed some excitement. Oh, come on. I think this is part of underneath conversations with God. I've heard Neil Donald Wall say God, God had to create the world so God could know God in all of expressions. What? Love doesn't need expressions. It's like it, love is love, and maybe there's spiritual expressions and extensions, but you don't need form. And some people say, well, is Jesus the only one that teaches this? I say, no, no, there's lots of teachers that have been teaching this. Mary Baker Eddy, there's no mind in matter. There's no life, truth, substance, or intelligence in matter. How clear can you get if people don't like the Course, go read your Christian Science uh, manual. That'll tell you the same thing. It's all there. It's all the same thing. But this movie is going to show us that as long as he hasn't faced that gap of guilt, as long as he hasn't faced that gap of guilt and fear in his mind, he's still having memories from the 1500s, from the 2000, from 25. He's still got this struggle going on. And what's the one message we've heard so far in the movie? Finish it. Do I have any hands? Does anybody want to finish it with me? Are we ready to finally finish it? We're hearing the message loud and clear from this movie. Finish it. It's whispered to us too. Nobody's shouting at us. He's, finish it. Finish it. You notice how it's very soft. It's like a whisper. Finish it. Finish it. Finish it. So now, with the Course in Miracle and Jesus' help, we're like, okay, yes, show the way, lead the way, I'm ready, I'll go for it. And, and in this movie, this is what is really playing out. So it's really, this movie is not such a mystery at all. It's, it's really telegraphing, it's giving us the message loud and clear, scene after scene. So let's pause it here. I've never seen that again. I want, this may take us a while to get through this movie, but I, want you to, I don't want you to miss anything here, because it's, Jesus is trying to be so clear. He's, he's trying to really get his message across tonight. Now that's a medical lab. He's, just remember, he's turned away. His, his wife, Izzy, Izzy, Isness, said, come take a walk with me. And she went off into the light, and he rushes over there. You notice that this medical lab is frantic. The people in this lab are frantic. And they're looking for uh, evidence of, of some kind of treatment that works. They're looking to suppress, they're looking to suppress a tumor growth in Donovan. Now, some of you don't even know who Donovan is. He's not the singer who sang for Brother, Son, Sister, Moon. This is an animal. This is a poor animal that's on the... <laughs> on the operating table, and they're operating on deciding whether to try to, to treat him and give him more treatments of different variations to suppress a tumor. Now, this is Jesus poking fun again at the medical model. He's like saying, people, people, please. You know, even when he's trying to figure out how to reduce this tumor in size and suppress the tumor, he looks up and he looks up into this bright light. And he's, he takes it as ins, inspiration or guidance for this particular plant from, 
from wherever tropical or Africa, and 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 they're oh, and then we get the the DNA and get this to, one on top of another, and they're all it's searching through molecules. It's searching through the things that the medical model looks at to try to find a solution. And you know, this this always has fascinated me about time and space because you either go searching into the smaller units, you go into the, the molecules and the atoms and you go into the microcosm to search for answers, which is still the cosmos, or remember all those years and all the billions of dollars is sending rocket ships up into space to see if there's intelligent life in space, to see if see what's out there. So you see, when we're talking about distractions and we're talking about a lack of attention, it doesn't matter whether you go into the microcosm to look for answers into the molecules and the DNA and the atoms and splitting the atoms, like what they did with nuclear energy, or whether you go out into sending a probe, a, a rocket to Mars, or, oh, putting men on the moon. Whoa! Billions of dollars. What did that accomplish? It's looking in the wrong direction. With It's taking your curiosity, instead of taking it into your mind, toward that gap, which is what A Course in Miracles is having us do taking us on an inward journey, going past that fear to look within, and going in there to face this gap and go beyond the gap to, to eternal life, this egoic mechanism of getting has made up this cosmos, and it doesn't matter whether you go in the macrocosm looking for answers or the microcosm, it's still looking outside yourself. It's, Jesus has the same thing to say for searching in the cosmos, and searching in the microcosm, he says, seek not outside yourself, for it will fail and you will weep each time an idol falls. He doesn't care if it's microscopic idols, like, like DNA and molecules, or if it's cosmic. You're still trying to figure out the quasars and the black holes. Still trying to figure out, figure out the nebulas, astronomy, astrologers. It doesn't matter which direction you look in, the microcosm or the macrocosm, it's not there. He said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. It's within the mind. And you have to go in and face and go past this gap in the mind. So this movie is making it really clear because what our main character, Tommy, our doubting Thomas, the, the reason he's a doubting Thomas is he is very attached to his wife. He has married her, she has been diagnosed with a disease, and now he has such a fear of loss, such a fear of separation, such a fear of never seeing her body again, that he is frantically operating on Donovan, this poor animal that has is, is got to be the one to take all these experiments to try to find the cure to try to find the thing that will save Izzy. And meanwhile, Izzy, does she look bothered to you? I mean, every time we see Izzy's face, she's always smiling, she's saying, come and take a walk with me. She's happy. She's, she's surrendering into the holy instant. She's surrendering into the grace. She's, she's surrendering the belief that the world has to be controlled. And what a contrast between Izzy the Surrenderer and, and Tommy, Doubting Thomas, who is frantically trying to play personal savior. And there are no personal saviors. Even Christianity goes off a bit where they, you know, when they tell you, you know, Jesus Christ wants you to go out and save the world. Okay, what does that mean? Well, there's lost souls. There are. Yeah. Yeah, there are. And there's, there's thousands of them. There's, there's millions of lost souls out there. And the reason they're lost is because they haven't heard the Word of God. So you need to tell me. All I have to do is go whisper to those 
poor children in Africa. Jesus. Just say the name, Jesus. And then there'll be a save soul. Yes. And then what? Well, you've got to save more. There's, there's a lot of lost souls. You've got to get out there and evangelize. And this is a misinterpretation of, of evangelism. Jesus told us the kingdom of heaven is within. He didn't tell us, go out and save lost souls. He said, find the kingdom of heaven within yourself. And, and then you will know that you are the light of the world. You know, in the Course in Miracles, he, that's one of his workbook lessons, you know. I am the light of the world. I share the light of the world. You know, I shine the light of the world. It's, he's talking about a state of mind when you go past this inner gap and you reach this happiness and this joy. And you've got so much joy you can't even contain it. Now we're talking salvation. But we're not talking theo theological, you know. I, I had a friend years ago who, uh, his name was Randy, and he was a teacher. And I asked him, well tell me about your life. And he said he was a missionary. And he was sent by the Christian church to Africa to go save souls. I said, how did that go? He said, well, I went over there to Africa and I went to save the souls and I started working with the children and I thought, we're the ones that need saving. These kids are happy. These kids are happy. We need saving. <laughs> and I said, well, what happened? And he said, I became so disillusioned with trying to save the happy children <laughs> that I left Christianity. <laughs> and I, I was like, well, I think it's just maybe an interpretation thing <laughs> there. It's like, I think Jesus wants us to shine our light and be happy and loving towards everyone. Love your neighbor as yourself. But it's this whole thing of going to save lost souls. And somehow they even count them. How many souls have you saved in your crusade? Oh, I saved 1,720. You know, it's, it's, not, it's missing the mark, it's missing the meaning. It's, if you're happy, the whole world's happy. If you're not, then it gets into all kinds of games like projecting lost souls, even. It's, it's a perceptual problem. The whole point of The Course in Miracles is to say, you're hallucinating a private world, and your hallucination is because you believe in the ego. But there's only one private world. You may think there's, there, every person has their own private world going, but it's just one private world. And what he says when you accept the atonement, you realize the hoax of all this private minds and private thought stuff. So it's really straightforward and clear, but what, what really we're seeing here is when we look at Tommy, we can see the same obsession that he has is the obsessions that we have had when we believed in the ego. Food obsessions, work obsessions, sexual obsessions, becoming a careeraholic where everything's about the career. Sometimes people do that with their family and their children. They have children, everything's about the children. And basically they say, to hell with the rest of the world. I've got a child now. You see how the ego doesn't care where you aim it. But you have to remember what Jesus teaches us. That salvation is for the mind and it is only experienced through peace. Salvation isn't for saving the rainforest. Jesus, I, said, I tried this with Jesus. I said, what about the rainforest? He said, save your mind. Global warming, save your mind. Well, Jesus, I don't like the current political system. This was 20 years ago. Now, oh God, God help me. It's like, save your mind. But what about, the, I don't like this president. Well, yeah, who put him there? Save your mind. For free your mind, like Morpheus said in the Matrix, by releasing the ego. Forgive the ego, belief. Forgive your mind for the ego belief and then recognize heaven. It's, it's that simple. But as long as we see the problem outside, whether it's in 
finding a cure for pandemic or finding a cure, in this case, for his wife, for Izzy, then it's all in the wrong direction. And, and that's why the spiritual journey is, is one of, of inner practice. Our, even our community is evolving. You know, right now we're doing movies and we've done all kinds of retreats and gatherings, but we may end up all levitating, like uh, this guy in 2500 for all we know. We may end up using tele telepathy, we may end up coming into all kinds of psychic powers and realms, all for the purpose of letting it go. Not to try to manifest anything, but just the natural state of the mind and its power coming back as we forgive our ego beliefs, as we let go of the ego beliefs. I see you, Patrice, is, Patrice is, she's in my groove. The, just the first time I saw you when I was in Sedona, I was speaking, you were back there shaking and rocking and you're, you're ready for liftoff. You are, you are ready, girl. I'm watching you while I'm talking. You're like, you're, you're just ready to just blast off. This movie is just the right thing for you. Okay, let's get back. We're still in the movie. We, we'll be here past midnight if I keep coming in here and show. But there's so many good parts, I just can't, I don't want you to miss anything. It's just so good. Okay. So beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Now we see that there she is out with her bare feet in the snow. She's all curious about Mayan philosophy, about how they chose a, a dying star to represent their underworld. That's the gap. She's curious about the gap. She's curious about the healing in the mind. I mean, Mayan philosophy, and Maya, what does Maya mean? It's illusion. It's deep. You know, she's been diagnosed with a disease and she's playfully pondering what's the point of it all, what's, what's the purpose of all. She's even finished, almost writing a book, finished writing a book that starts off with the the conquistador and, the, and the, the queen, and then she says it goes all the way to the nebula. Meaning, it starts in Spain and it goes all the way to the nebula wrapping around the golden glow. You know, she's, she's kind of seeing that there is a point to everything, and that even with stars, they seem to die. And what, what does that mean scientifically? They're burning gases and they burn out. And what's beyond that? You know, she's curious. She actually has a curious mind. Even though she's been diagnosed with an illness, she's pondering, she's writing a book starting in Spain and ending out with the nebula. And this is what I call a broad-reaching perspective. If you try to understand this world between birth and death, good luck, no chance. There, there is nothing that can be understood between birth and death. It, you have to have a broader perspective in your mind to start to realize that there's something beyond this veil that is eternal. That actually, Jesus is really telling us, you were never born and you will never die. You know, you're light. You're light. And maybe you forgot that light, maybe you've had a case of amnesia, but it doesn't mean that that, that light is gone. The light hasn't gone anywhere. It, it just is. That's our main character of the movie, Izzy. Light is. That's one of the movies I use so much in the Movie Watcher's Guide is Solaris. Solar is light. Light is. That's, that's what Solaris means. It means light is. It's not really about the, the maya, it's not really about the forgetting, it's not really about the amnesia, it's about the remembering. It's about light, light is. And oh, to have our heart lit up, to have our state of mind lit up. Why do we practice A Course in Miracles psychologically throughout the day, except to light up, uh, except to realize the truth of light? That's the whole point. And then some, sometimes if your mind is ready, you do get revelatory experiences, you get a direct experience of that light. Whoa! You know, that, that puts everything in a whole new perspective. When you have a revelatory experience, you go, whoa! Wow! 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 And, and so, 
here we are again with Izzy representing the, the almost like the childlike curiosity of what is the meaning of life, is what I see it as. She's, she's playful, she's, even with the diagnosis, she's not taking that seriously, she's, she's using every moment that she has to discover what it is that she is meant to discover. And isn't that a great description of the spiritual journey, to use every moment, every precious instant, to discover the nature of who you are. Even if the world of time and space was, was made to pull, pull over, like Morpheus says, to blind you from the truth. That's what the matrix is. He defines it as it's the world pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. Even if time and space was pulled over, your eyes to blind you from the truth, if you just have that curiosity about the isness, <laughs> and Izzy is showing us the way. So let's see where it goes. She's, she's doing her part. Again, there's the reinforcement. She's having a joyful talk with him, saying, here, I want you to read the book, it's not finished, but read it, read it now. And then when the phone rings, she says, don't answer it. This is what happens with it, the mind's attention, you know. If the mind gets obsessed about outcomes, if the mind is obsessed for looking for solutions in form, you know how it goes. That's, that's the beginnings of workaholism, that's the beginnings of stress, that's the beginnings of busyness, that's the beginnings of, of ob obsessiveness. And the present moment and the grace of the present moment doesn't go with this obsession with outcomes. You know, you, if you listen to Eckhart Tolle talk, he's talking about surrendering to life itself. He's talking about surrendering to the moment. He's talking about yielding to it. He's using these words. And this is basically what we're seeing from Izzy. She's like a call into the isness. And, and he is so sure, scientifically, that the cure is to be found in the body, that he doesn't have time to spend with her while she's inviting him to it. He's, it's the, these are the two directions. And that's why, you know, if you hear me talk about manifesting and law of attraction and everything, to the extent that, that it helps you see how powerful your mind is, it, it actually can be helpful. But then the, the ego will hijack the law of attraction and turn it into the law of manifestation. It's okay if you're attracted to the kingdom of heaven. There's nothing wrong with that. It's okay if you're attracted to the holy instant. That's good. It's okay if you're attracted to the present moment. That's spectacular. Jesus is cheering us on with all of those things. But when you turn the law of attraction into manifestation, the question from Jesus is, what makes you think you know what is most helpful for you? Do you really think more things, more stuff, more skills, more abilities, more wealth, you really think these things bring you to the present moment? You know, I, uh, the last retreat we did, I think it was, uh, one of, there was a couple of them. I was doing um, Eddie Murphy, but the, the one before, I was talking about the Beyond All Idols section. What is an idol? Do you think you know? An idol is for more of something. It does not matter more of what. More, it's not the objects that, that are the problem. It's the wish in the mind to have more of something to take the place of the Kingdom of Heaven. Clearly we can start to see this is what these inattentiveness patterns are about. It's getting all caught up with what Shakespeare called much ado about nothing. If you're focused on the outcomes, like, like uh, Tommy is on finding a, a cure uh, for his wife, if you're focused on the outcomes, then you will obsessively pursue that. And if you're focused on the present moment, you 
start to trust more and more that everything is taken care of. I think the issue that, that, that is the biggest difficulty in spirituality is that people believe they have two lives. They say, yep, I like to, I wish I could meditate more, David, yep, I wish I could forgive, I wish I could just be still, and, and I say, and, and what, and what, what's, what's, what else is there? Well, it's the world, the world. What about the world? Well, I've got all these practical things, you see, that I have to take care of. Oh, practical things. More practical than the present moment. Oh yeah, there's, pra there's bills to pay, there's things to see, there's things to do. Yeah, you, you start to realize, that's what I had to face when I was in my 20s. I started to study the Course, pray, meditate, listen to Jesus and everything, and then this part of my mind was going, how long are you going to waste on your prayers and your meditations? There's important things that have to be dealt with. And in the end, Jesus was like, would you please give those to me, those important things? Uh, can, you, can you trust me to handle these things so that you can give yourself over to what is truly important? Letting the voice for God speak through you, smiling, laughing, sharing, sharing the Beatitudes. That's what this life is for. It's not to get caught up into telling yourself you have two different lives. That's what most people would tell me. They would say, well, I have a spiritual life and then I have a worldly life. Really? You have two lives? Hmm. No man can serve two, two masters, but what, tell me about these two lives. Well, there's the practical life of dealing with the world, and then there's this inner life I feel. Well, A Course in Miracles is, is helping the mind realize that that inner life and that outer life are actually the same. That if you, if you come in harmony with the principles that Jesus is teaching, that will handle your so-called outer life as well as your inner life. Why wouldn't the principles work with everything? In the end, of course, Jesus says it's not really out there. He shows us. He shows us that it's our mind. We're, we're not really inside the projection where we are the mind. We are the consciousness. As Eckhart might say, we are awareness. As Krishnamurti might say, you, beyond right and wrong, beyond thought, you know, as Deepak might say, pure potentiality. You, it doesn't matter whatever flavor, whatever words you want to call it. It's, it's, there's a presence that is where our attention is, and it's not into solving the jigsaw puzzle of the world. You know, that's what this movie is really showing us. Back and forth we see between Izzy and between Tommy. Okay, here we go, more. More back and forth until our co conclusion. <laughs> so that's very strong symbology. Now we're bringing in the, the book that she's writing. Spain, we know Spain, we have our center in Mallorca, and we are broadcasting from New Spain, Mexico, where the Mayans are. And I have to tell you, it's not a tree that we're hiding. It's in Cursa de Milagros. It's <laughs> in Cursa de Milagros is, is the tree. It's the pathway. It's, it's taking us past all the protectionisms. I mean, obviously, it's fantastic to see these scenes with the Inquisitor because, you know, Europe is kind of known for a few things, you know, the, It's the Crusades, killing Muslims, and the Spanish Inquisitions. Those are two f famous uh, events in European history. One involved just trying to wipe out Muslims, and the other one, in, in the name of Jesus, no less. And then the, the Spanish Inquisition was a, a power, a takeover attempt to take over land uh, and take power from the rulers um, using the Bible. You have sinned, you, you, I judge you, and now I need your blood. 
Wow, what a scheme. In the name of Jesus, that's a pretty, the ego is a hijacker. It's hijacked the Christian religion over there with the Crusades, killing Muslims in the name of Jesus, and then the Spanish Inquisition, very, very famous. But you can see, we got, we got to see the Inquisitor before the, the, they came in to see him, you know. That was part of the belief system. You heard it, they said, the, the body is the prison for the soul. So if the body's the prison, then the body's the problem. You saw him when he took his robe off and he was using those, he was putting stripes of blood on his back because that's again an ego uh, misuse of Christianity. Punish the body, uh, whip the body. He was putting stripes of, of blood and pain up to, to make his penance, you know. And Jesus is like saying, God is not a God of sacrifice. God does not demand pain. God does not demand that you punish the body. But if you look at the history of spirituality, you, you have to go all the way back to the times of Jesus, where you have the pure teachings directly from Jesus about salvation, and then even after Jesus, it was so close to Jesus that the early Gnostics who lived at the time period right after Jesus, they got from Jesus' teachings that the world was an illusion. That's pretty good. I mean, if you look at all the different, the, the different offshoots of Christianity throughout these last you know, 2,000 years, but the early Gnostics were pretty close except they couldn't quite grasp what Jesus was talking about, about the kingdom of heaven. So they figured that um, if the body wasn't real, and the world wasn't real, then you should, be enabled to, you should be able to indulge in all the pleasures of the world, because the body's not real. And then they had some strange things about beating up the body too, because it's not real, so you can, you, know, you can harm it. They didn't quite realize what Jesus is teaching in the Course, and what he was teaching 2,000 years ago, that, that pain and pleasure, that was one of our topics, are two sides of the same coin. That both pain and pleasure reinforce the reality of the body. Not that it's real, but in awareness, when you seek for pleasure, you will get pain, Jesus tells us. It's impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. So Jesus is giving all of the ego's secrets away in the Course. That's why we're here in the New Spain right now, and we're here to tell you that it's not a tree. We've already searched around for the trees here, and it, Ken can tell you there's good soil and you can grow potatoes and sweet potatoes. We can grow abundantly with vegetables and fruits, but there is no tree of life here in New Spain. But in Cursa de Milagros, we have discovered that Jesus is giving away all of the ego's secrets in this book that he's, he's channeled through Helen Schuckman. And that's why movies like this, and, and learning to, these teachings, learning to apply these teachings in your everyday life, in order of letting go of protectionism. Like she's like, she, he's like, I failed Spain. And she's like, yes, yes, the darkness is around us, but, but we, you know, we will prevail over the, the Inquisitor. You know, she's no doubt that they will prevail. But she said, it's, it's not through killing uh, the, the Inquisitor. You know, she's, she's wise enough to realize that there, is, there has to be another answer. In her sense, she's talking about the Mayans. And now, even the book that she's writing is talking about the, the Mayans, the ancient New Spain, and, and she's bringing in these ideas. But, but basically, she says that the Bible in Genesis, there was the tree of knowledge and the tree of life, and it says that when Adam and Eve took a bite out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's where the fall seemed to happen, and then the tree of life was hidden. It just means that the Holy Spirit was given as an immediate answer to the belief in separation, but the ego blocked, p pushed the Holy Spirit and the separation out of awareness. 
push them down into the secret dream, push them down into the unconscious where the mind was not aware of it, made up a projected world which Jesus calls the dream that you gave away, and now everything, science, philosophy, medicine, families, everything, education, religion, most of it's focused on the dream that was given away and this tiny little gap in the mind where the secret dream is, is has remained hidden. So that's where we could say the tree of life, it's being called, has been hidden. It's been pushed out of awareness and that's why religions kind of focus on here's the good things, do lots of those, here's the bad things, don't do those. Do the good things, you'll go to heaven. Do the bad things, you'll burn in eternal hell. You know, it's, it's a quite a simplistic view, but it doesn't quite ever talk about the secret dream. And what, what, is the, what are the ego's motives underneath that's been pushed out of awareness? So, so basically she's teaching through her attitude that that through grace, through surrender, through living in the moment, through trusting, through having faith. That's what Jesus talked about too. These are the ways. And it's not through protectionism. I think the most striking thing for me when I see this movie is, okay, you see, you see Tommy in 2000 and he is like the great protector. He's the great scientific, researcher, protector of the wife. I will save you, I will save your life, I will find the cure in the body. I will find the cure in, in the body and I am your protector. And then now she's written a book and it's, oh my gosh, it's just playing out the same pattern, the same identity from 500 years before where he's the conquistador not the research scientist, he's a conquistador and he's trying to save Spain and save the queen. You know, and so we're seeing the pattern and then we even get glimpses of him in the year 2500 and sure enough he's still getting these memories. These past memories have not been washed. Even in the year 2500 he's still thinking about his wife. He's still remembering one of the early scenes when he met her. Remember when she's got long hair and she's kind of running and she's got a bright red dress on and she's so happy? He, he remembers all these joyful memories of her and he's associated the love in his heart with her, with the form, and he's desperately doing anything he can to find the cure because he can't bear to stand to lose her. That's, that's the belief in loss that comes from the projection of these hypotheticals. As long as you believe that the past is real or the future is real, then you believe hypotheticals are real and therefore you put all this energy into trying to fix them, preserve them, change them, make them better, and so on and so forth. That's where the distractions of the world come in. That's where all this huge investment of energy comes in from the mind that's focused on the form. And meanwhile the secret dream, the, the gap in the mind has not been discovered. So, you know, if you put the teachings of A Course in Miracles together with this movie, you can see that this movie is really a graphical depiction of why the mind is having trouble waking up. The ego has made a very sneaky trap that involves trying to better the form, or change the form, or fix the form. And it's telling us that the source of disease is in the form, and the cure is in the form. Even though throughout history, you know, oh there's polio, oh they develop a polio vaccine. Oh there's this treatment, this disease, this treatment. Whether it's polio, or it's uh, some form of virus, or some form of disease, it goes down in the history books of, oh, this, the medical profession discovered the antidote, discovered the, the cure. Only thing is, there's more and more and more viruses, disease, seemingly environmental problems, problems around food supply, food chain, earth changes, hurricanes, volcanoes, 
uh, global warming, flooding, on and on and on and on. All the just projected effects of this, uh, these hypotheticals that the ego is using to scare the mind, to keep the mind feeling trapped. And meanwhile, Jesus is like saying, relax, calm down, <laughs> be still, come, follow my instructions, I will take you in past this gap and back to eternal life. And all you have to do is have willingness to follow. That's all it takes. It doesn't, it doesn't take a lot of money. It doesn't take intelligence. It doesn't take spectacular skills. It just takes willingness and dedication and devotion to not be distracted by all these other generated hypotheticals that the ego is trying to throw up as its smokescreen. So, wow, what a nice little snippet we, we were back in Spain, and here we are from broadcasting from New Mexico. <laughs> New Mexico, New Spain. That's what it was called back then, in the 1500s. Okay, we're back to the wedding ring. You know, the ring is a beautiful symbol of marriage. It's a symbol of union, it's a symbol of oneness, it's a circle. No beginning and no end, but, but ever since he's become obsessed with finding a cure, he's spending less, less time with his wife, less time in the, the joining, the deep connection, the prayer, and, and more in the obsession for looking for an external solution. And then, then his ring disappears, his wedding ring disappears. And he's noticing that. Even in his future life, when we saw him at the beginning of the movie, when it was the year 2500, he had a little black uh, mark and the ring was missing. And so what Jesus is really doing, it's all symbolic. He's just saying, when you pursue solutions in this world, when you try to fix the world, when you try to change the world, when even when you try to make the world a better place, you're still, you, your wedding ring is gone. You, you are off uh, in an ego pursuit. And he comes right out and he says, seek not to change the world. Seek rather to change your mind about the world. He goes on to tell us it's a perceptual problem, that as long as you misdefine the problem, you can never find the correction because you can't, solve the problem in the form, you have to solve the problem in the mind. Einstein, a scientist, said that you can't solve the problem at the level of the problem. You have to go beyond it to, to solve it. He, he was intuitive, he knew there must be some kind of solution to this world, but it was beyond the level of, of form that, that the scientists were working at. That was, that's where spirituality and science have to come together. That's where quantum physics and A Course in Miracles actually do come together. Because both quantum physics and A Course in Miracles are teaching that there is no world apart from what you think. There is no world apart from consciousness. That, that the world is part of consciousness and that you have to heal or transcend or in the course terms, find the correction, find the, the real world, the happy dream, that's the tippy top of consciousness. That's, that's getting closer to reality, which is just pure light. So we're really starting to see that, that, that with that ring missing, he knows something fundamental is off. And yet, he's not really paying attention to that symbol. You know, he was searching for it, but then they said, you have to just, we'll find it, just keep doing. His, his uh, other scientists said, just keep working, we'll find a cure and just forget about it. But now he's just had this argument with, uh, with his boss and, and he's, then he's again noticing the ring is missing. What comes to mind is in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, when we were created, as Christ, it wasn't a passive thing. In other words, Jesus says in the Course, when God created Christ as a beautiful, perfect spiritual being, 
Christ answered, yes. It wasn't passive. It wasn't like, we didn't say to God, uh, what did you do to me? Oh, I, you created me. It was like God gave this huge, eternal spirit, creative ability, everything. God gave everything away to Christ in creation. And then Christ, it says in the Course, answered, yes. There was, it was almost like a marriage ceremony in heaven. I create you perfect. Yes, I accept my perfection. Thank you. I love you. There was a yes. There was a, there was a promise <laughs> made. I have to use the word promise. There was a promise. There was an eternal commitment to that. And there's no going back on that. That just means, yeah, we're the Christ. We, we said yes to that creation, and we can play amnesia game. We can play, oh, turn my back. But that's the original promise. That's an eternal promise. There's no breaking it. There, no, no matter what we try to do in time and space, we can't break that promise. That's God's will. God's will for us is to, is to be an eternal creation, happy, free, forever. And there's nothing of this world that can stand in the way of that. So, when his ring is missing, to me, that's like, he, that's a sign of something's been lost. Uh, something's left awareness that, that is still there. It, it, it just needs to, there needs to be a turnaround, you know, like, when I would even read the Old Testament, you know, I would read some of these old prophets, in the Old Testament, but I really like the I really like John the Baptist. You know, that, I like he's a cool guy. He's the harbinger. He's the he's like the last prophet before Jesus. And so, what did John the Baptist? What did he preach? I, when I look at the Bible, he was going around telling everybody in Judea, repent. I kind of like that word. I know some people don't like it, but I like the word repent, because repent just means turn, turn around. <laughs> turn, turn back to God. Repent. You know, people, it's got a bad connotation now. People are like, oh God, I was told repent, repent. Yeah, repent, that's what the Course is saying, repent. Turn to your right mind. Turn to the light. Turn away from the, the deceiving belief of the ego and turn to the light. I like that, repent. And then of course John the Baptist was the prophet that when Jesus came along, um, Jesus started, he went there to see John. John was preaching in the middle of the river, the Jordan River, and then he started baptizing people. And then when he got, when Jesus got out there and Jesus got dunked and got baptized, that's when the dove some of you remember the story, the dove came down from the heavens and landed on Jesus' head. And then the voice from the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. There's that ring. There's the ring. That's the ring right there. This is my beloved Son, in whom I will... That's all of us. That's our ring. We can't blow it. We can't turn away from that. There's no way. You can't. You, you make a promise to God and you're going to try to ditch God? No way. God is not ditchable. You can't snub God. You can't ditch God. You can, you can try to make up something else and make up fantasy land and, and pretend you have another identity. You can go for an Oprah makeover and you can remake yourself and reinvent yourself and get into the new age and remanifest yourself in a hundred thousand different ways, but that still doesn't change the, the ring, the fact. The fact. Christ is Christ. We are the Christ. We cannot possibly turn away from that, that Christ creation, that Christ being that we are. So to me, I, I like the symbology in this movie that he's, as long as he's frantically pursuing this cure. And notice the time thing is, oh, there's not time. And his boss is saying, you're doing sloppy surgeries. He's like, it's like time's running out. Basically, he's telling his boss, like, I, I'm frantic, but I, I've got to find a solution. But that's coming from desperation. That's coming from fear 
that, that, these actions are coming very clearly from fear of loss. He's so afraid of losing his wife that he's frantically doing anything he can to, to bring about a solution, ignoring the signs that the, the ring is off the finger. And, and I think in my life I've, I've come to see more this world is just, it's just symbols from the Holy Spirit trying to reach my mind. So when I find a ring is missing, I, I stop and go, whoa, what's this mean? Or when I see a symbol in my life, I, I pay attention to the symbols. Because I know that in the dream world, the symbols are, are pointers. You know, they're clues. I'm not just ignoring them or trying to push them out of awareness. I'm paying attention to the signs along the way. That's a song from Madonna in her ray of light, traveling down the road, watching the signs as I go. I'm watching the signs like Madonna, you know, looking all around, pay attention to the signs. And here this movie is full of them. It's just everywhere. This movie is, is actually such a reminder that, that, that what we call birth and death, these are just made up concepts. And that Jesus tells us that death is a belief in the mind that can be released in any moment. That's, that is the gap that I've been talking about. So, so <clears throat> it goes a little beyond the, the Mayan philosophy of like, which is still kind of prevalent even to this day in Mexico about the celebration of death and it's, it's an attempt to embrace death, but what Jesus does is he basically is saying that death is a purpose in your mind. It's not physical. Just like there's no physical illness, it's all mental illness. It's, there's not anything actually such as physical death. The thing that has been accepted and believed to be is that death is the end of life and that life begins at birth. But um, certainly with Jesus, Helen Shuckman, the scribe, had many experiences where he would take her flying, <laughs> flying along through by the timeline. And um, at one point, uh, they flew so fast that they flew past the entire life of Helen Shuckman. And, and Jesus took her back and, and she was like shocked at how brief the life of Helen Shuckman was. It was like this tiny little blip in the overall construct, construct of time. And um, then, you know, as Jesus continued on dictating this Course in Miracles, you know, he basically says that it's just a belief. And at one point in the Manual for Teachers, he said that you can accept the atonement at any point, even at the point of death, seeming death in the world, the death of the body, you could merely rise up and say, I have no need of this at all. In one instant, even on your de so-called deathbed, you could simply rise up and say, I have no need of this at all. He's just showing us the power of the mind and, and that the correction for this error called death was offered and accepted long ago. Uh, and, and that it's really a matter of our desire to accept the correction. It's not a matter of time. Awakening is not a matter of time. It's more of a matter of desire, willingness and desire for the correction. So this is, this is good. It means it's like giving us the green light for full attentiveness to the purpose and not to be fooled by the projections and the fear of death in the future. Because that's still part of the body identification. If you are identified with the body and you think the body is who you are, or if you think the body is your home, then this outcome, a scenario or outcome in the future of the body dying you start to realize, wow, that's just a projection of the ego, again, meant to scare my mind and keep my mind into uh, a place of imprisonment and submission to this uh, idea. 
It's just an idea. It's a belief. So, as you go deeper in the spiritual journey and to get clearer you get about these two purposes, I mean, I, I always say that the, the one book that came through me that's the tiniest of all is Purpose is the Only Choice, the little black and white book. And yet, the whole point of the little, tiny little book is that, that the purpose of forgiveness is a choice that, that can be made, and can be made completely. And that that's the whole point of the mind training. It's not to try to make a better world, it's not to try to make better worldly conditions, it's not to try to live longer, because as I shared earlier, Jesus is telling us that this world is an impossible situation and the only way to escape an impossible situation is by experiencing that you are not there. <laughs> you are not in it. <laughs> ah, of course, that would have to be the solution. Um, and that's, that's what the revelation shows you, that's what what the light shows you, when you have a direct experience of light, you realize the truth, even if it's just a glimpse, even if it's just a glimpse of that light, you, you are so aware that, that, oh my gosh, that's the, that's the reality. That's why I, I think that the whole spiritual journey starts to get funnier and funnier when, when I start to read di different things about you create your problems. No, you don't. Uh, you, you create your reality. No, you don't create your reality either. Uh, you create yourself. No, you don't create yourself. Jace, basically, Jesus is teaching us that, that there really is no reality to miscreation. You cannot be something other than what God created. And so, if God created you perfect, if God created you spirit, ultimately miscreation can't be a reality. That's, that's what the healing is, is coming to, to realize that. And how does that happen except in your mind where you, where you become lit up and you become happy? Not, you're not happy in spite of the world, you're not happy in face of the world. It's more like you go and inside to embrace this purpose and that's where you find the happiness. And, and it, as you just give yourself over to it, you start to realize that's what the, the truth is. That's what the reality is. It's not based on appearances of the world. So that's why Jesus was a great way shower because he he transcended the ego before the body died. The resurrection, you know, in time terms, actually occurred before the crucifixion. And, and talk about spinning the old traditional story of death followed by resurrection. That's in terms of the body, but Jesus is saying death and the resurrection are not part of the body, they're part of the mind. When your mind is lit, you are resurrected. You remember the truth. That's what the mind training of A Course in Miracles is. It's not trying to avoid death of the body, and it's not trying to avoid reincarnation, it's, it's just coming into the reality of the light and going towards that. So, this movie really gives us a, a super uh, context for everything. It's so, uh, it was so well acted out. So here we are. We're not going to try to look for the plot, but Eric is ready <laughs> to open it up. I would love to hear your experiences of the fountain, uh, because it's, it's beautifully acted, beautifully graphic, and just share what's on your heart. What, what did you feel with it? What, did you, what was your experience with it? Did you have any insights with it? That's the joy. That's the glory of it all. Okay, I'm feeling to go to the Esther first. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before, before the movie, I was, the last couple of days I've been going through like feeling raw or the words uh, not myself or, you know, just off. And 
I would talk to Alan and he would point out that this is what I'm not. And I would get to the laughter and he said, I just got to train myself to remember that, that, and now I can't remember what he told me that was so perfect. (laughs) But, but, but what was, what was, what was happening for me, I was feeling from the movie that that was the insight that I got was that this was the story of me and Alan where I would die before and he would have to work with his feelings about the loss. And I don't want that as a fate for us, but I've always been seeing that every time we would watch a movie similar with those dynamics. And I want, I, I want to have a different experience and so I do work on the mind training so that when I am experiencing off, I, I, I'm seeing that that's not, that's not the purpose. That's not the, the, that's not it. And there was one other thing that happened with my mom and I, I recommended that she go to the, customer service to cash a larger bill and she did what I asked but they weren't able to help her and I just want to know like when I recommend something to her she I have to tell her a couple times before she'll do it but she does do it but then I'm telling her what to do in form and I don't know if if I'm I'm losing the purpose like it's hard because I just, I just don't know. Okay. Well, that's, that's two good uh, things that you're raising. One is that you were first raising this idea of who goes, who dies first, you or Alan, and you uh, would like it to be reversed. (laughs) You would like, maybe, or maybe you go side by side, like in, what was that movie? Uh, the, where they both die at the same time, simultaneously. But um, actually, that's what the movie is good about. It starts to bring it into, the, it's a purpose. You know, it's, it, uh, even the Course saying death is a decision and, you know, you can gently lay the body aside still is, is talking about it a little bit like it's something in form, like you decide when you exit. But again, what we're talking about, about eternal life is that you don't exit what you never entered. Uh, so this is, it takes it pr- beyond that. I mean, the, of course, Ken Wapnick was very, the first Course in Miracles teacher and uh, he passed away before uh, his, his wife, Gloria, and uh, she wasn't really happy from what people tell me. She was quite, quite upset that, uh, that he went first. And I've heard that from a lot of different uh, people. Judy Scutch, uh, you know, tells me that her and Wit used to talk about this all the time, like who's going to go first. But these kind of discussions, you know, all they are are opportunities to come back to the mind and just realize, oh my gosh, I, it's my decision to accept the atonement and to wake up to eternal life. It's not really about the dream characters. I, like I always say, dream characters don't wake up. Uh, you know, they're, that's the, they're, they're put there as part of the dream, you know, to prevent the waking up. And then the second one, um, when you were talking about your mother, you know, it's, it's helpful to think of Jesus because he's such a role model and way shower. But before he would even give a public talk, when he was in the fishing boat or he was just out among the people, he would just be there with them and he would look around the audience and then he would say, for those that have the ears to hear, let them hear. Uh, you, you have to have that same kind of attitude with your mother. If you tell her, mom, go get that bill changed, and she doesn't do it. You say, mom, go get that bill changed, maybe three times. You, it's okay to let the spirit come through you with helpful uh, ideas. That's beautiful. You, you are, have such a flowering of helpful ideas. 
But you can't have an expectation of the form. Because remember, it's sharing the ideas of God, sharing the love of God, teaching only love for that is what you are. God's teachers are not perfect or they would not be here. And so they come to teach perfection over and over and over until they've learned it. It's a mind lesson. That's why I really enjoy my function uh, of, of teaching what I would learn because I get to teach and teach and teach and teach and teach over and over and over and over and over. After all, it's like, huh, who's counting? Who cares? You know, you get into the joy, like, ooh, this feels good. I like sharing true ideas. And then whether anybody accepts them, it's not my responsibility. I'm heaven, I'm like Johnny Appleseed, the Swedenborgian minister who had a, he gave him a, a sack of apple seeds and he put it over his shoulder and he went around just flinging the seeds. He got so happy just flinging the seeds and flinging the seeds. And that to me is the joy of giving. That's what Jesus is teaching us. We teach with our attitude. Sometimes it involves words. It can be my mom, go get that pill changed. But, but it always never comes with expectations. Because it's always for our own mind. That's what the gift is. You know, you're strengthening these wonderful ideas. So I say, great, let those ideas flower in your mind, share them happily, and just, that's what we usually talk about on these Wednesday nights, take your hands off of the wheel. <laughs> don't, don't follow your mom <laughs> to see what happened, <laughs> you know. You can send her on her happily, merrily way with your merry thoughts, but then don't, don't look to the form. That's what I think the, the Tommy character had to learn, you know. He, he was trying to be helpful the best that he could, which was, with his belief, looking for a, uh, a cure. Uh, he put a lot of effort into f trying to find the cure. But when that didn't work, you know, in the end, he was a little frustrated when she kept coming and visiting him. And she had said, write the final chapter, finish it. And, and that was a big let go. Because they had the symbol of the body there and he thought he was wounded, he could use the, the white, what, it almost looked like a, like a syrupy white thing coming out of the tree of life and he used it and he thought, oh good, you know, and as, as his, his cut started to heal, you could see how happy he was and I could, I could hear Jesus in my mind laughing, do not ask the Holy Spirit to, to heal the body. <laughs> and he's all of a sudden, you know, it's more than, he starts guzzling, <laughs> he goes to guzzle the sap or whatever the white sap is off the tree of life. And then it, pretty soon the body, the, the green leaves are coming out from everywhere. Oh, the thunder is coming too. The Jesus is enjoying that one. But it's a merge. I saw that as a merge of consciousness. Like, why is the body any different than the leaves? Or what, what makes, the body's not our home, neither are the leaves, neither is the earth. You know, it, in the end it's like a merge of, of of um, perception. It, it all comes together uh, and we start to realize that that it's all part of our mind. It's not, uh, these are not external events or external uh, identities. We don't have an external identity. Neither the leaves, nor the trees, nor the bodies, nor the bees. I had to rhyme it there. <laughs> okay, so thank you Esther. Always love hearing from you. We'll see if Patrice has got her mic working. Can you hear me? Yes. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This is so crazy. I watch so much of you, David, that it's, it's weird to know that you're really live here. It's really, really you. I hear your voice so much <laughs> that I hear it without any tech anymore. But... Um, Wow, it's so funny that um, I thought maybe that I wasn't sure what my question was about because there's so many things going on and, and, then, and then it's funny because it feels like Esther kind of made it 
focus for me, <laughs> which, and that's, it, that goes to sort of my question. I really feel here, like I, it's funny, like I don't, I look at that movie and I just don't see anything weird at all about, I'm just like, yep, uh-huh. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, I know, you know? <laughs> and, and I'm like, I start out with the movie starts and I go, wow. How could it be that every single thing is made perfectly for me? And then I think every single thing is made perfectly for every other single person. And then that's where I'm really tripped up. I kind of keep coming back to that. Like, I want to say, I'm sorry, what are you again? Who are you again? What's going on again? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this, like, okay, you're a dream figure. What, but you're dreaming too. What? You know, and even with the death, I could feel him, you know, crying over losing his wife like that. I could totally feel it. And I did not myself cry at all inside or outside because, and my husband died a few years ago. And I know that everything, but even that, it's just like, yep. Mm -hmm. And, but what I don't know, like what's been happening for the past several years now is my, it's as if my life has been flashing before my eyes only slowly rather than super quickly, like I'm about to die. But it's like, yeah, I am going to die at some point and my life has already begun to flash before my eyes. And it's a lot. It's, and it, it, at first it scared me and now I'm really at this kind of place with it where because so much has relaxed and so much I've been convinced so much. I don't have a whole lot of, it seems like guilt and just ah, standing in the way of all these memories. So these memories are coming kind of more whole or just, I can feel them more and see them more and I don't react, but my feeling is more like, I, it's like I can see inside the memory to what was real in there. And all of a sudden, like similarly to like, I noticed mm, this journey makes you a good person. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It may not be trying to make you a good person, but you sort of start to be more of a good person with this journey. You know what I mean? Like I start similarly, I'm seeing like this thing of like, um, hmm, uh, this, this journey, um, makes I can't remember because I lost it there but it's something like with like how I'm relating to the memories um so and then I get this feeling like almost like oh like I'm keep being given back a gift after it's been made right or something like my relationship with my husband, for example, my husband, you know, oh my God, you know, can, I'm sure anyone could imagine the guilt, anyone, a, a person studying A Course in Miracles could imagine the guilt that I felt through our entire relationship. But then when he was dying and then when he died, like, oh my God, you know, and, but now it's like there was there's more of everything else there's more of love now that's available for me that's here and like here there's this giant photograph of my me and my little brother like a week before he died and i couldn't even remember him for 15 years and suddenly i'm okay and more than okay with i want a picture of him and me on my wall which i never would have put up like it's okay with me now but where I'm a little bit like it is there is this fear of sacrifice. Like, oh no, I just now got everybody back. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just now. 
can finally feel good and okay about life and my relationships. All of them, even the ones, my brother's dead, my father, my, my husband, those are my three favorite people. And they all dead, died. And like, and it's like, I'm getting that back. Like, even, even like, I'm just seeing so much just bounty in those relationships. I can't say one bad thing about the fact that they die. Like, no, I can't, I can't. It's all so gorgeous to me. But I'm afraid, like, I feel like Muji said, when Muji said, you know, he was like, I was afraid that I was going to be a, a hunchback if I, <laughs> if I let go. And, you know, and like, God, that's where I feel like I'm at. Like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm afraid something's going to happen to me. And even though I can really see like all this quantum stuff and I can, and I can also very clearly see that Oh, for God's sake. Oh, that's what I was going to say. It makes you mature. It makes you sober. You're just like, like today, I had such a moment of just utter sobriety. I was like, yeah, you see it or don't, whatever. Like, you know what I mean? It's just like, you're not, like, it's just like, this is not even anything that's happening. But anyways, I'm just saying like, I'm just like, I don't, now I just get this at this point, you know what I mean? When it's like, but then... David is a, a beautiful experience. And it's like, I have this thing. Am I supposed to be, I feel like, am I going to throw out the bat baby with the bath water? Like, what is life? Again, I forgot. You know what I mean? Like, the closer I get to, like, knowledge, then it's like my mind explodes. And I'm like, oh. uh-uh. And there's fear. But I don't even know what the fear is of but it is like something's going to happen or sacrifice. I don't know. I'm just saying maybe, and these memories come and I love, there's something in these memories that's powerful. I just wanted to say that to you about the memories and maybe there's like something in here you can tell me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Patrice. Thank you. You know, Jesus, he tells us uh, that only the loving thoughts are true and, and the past has been saved in purified form. You know, whenever I read that, I'm like, wow, that's got to be like beautiful memories. If everything, the past is only saved in purified form. And I think when you start to feel that beauty uh, and you start to feel that, that connection and, and happiness, like, wow, everything's coming right, that's just the way that it's going. I think the scene that really touched me watching this movie tonight too, was toward the end when, when her knees buckled and she started to go down. And he was right there and he called her name, Is, and he grabbed, he, he grabbed her. And then she said, as I, start, as I began to fall, I felt so full, she said, full. And we know what she was meaning. You know what she's meaning, the fullness. You're feeling it. You're feeling it more and more. She felt so full. Full, that's so different than this lack we've all felt in our life, this guilt, this emptiness, this hole that we had in our heart, like something was missing, you know. It's like that song, um, that song, Where is the love you said was mine, oh mine, till the end of time, was it just a lie? Where is the love, we had a, where is the love hole? And then, all of a sudden, as... It's like Jesus is making everything right in our hearts. And we're feeling the fullness. And you're putting the picture, you know, on the, on the wall before you, you couldn't bear to have it there. Now you love to have it there. So I, I think, and then the, the funny thing I noticed about that scene too is, she said, I was so full, she said to Tommy. I was so full. And, and she said, I was held. I was held. And then Tommy said, yeah. I caught you. I was like, oh man, oh man, that's, that's the two thought systems right there. I'm so full, I was held. Yeah, I caught you. You know, it's, it, the ego t wants to take credit for everything. He, the ego doesn't even know what fullness means <laughs> or catching. <laughs> oh yeah, it caught the body. <laughs> but she was like saying, I was held. And she was, it's the held in the love and the light. So, you know, it's these two thought systems and 
you know, you're just opening and surrendering and yielding in like she did to this beautiful, loving light that's there for you. And the ego is a bit concerned and afraid of this whole thing because it, as that continues, then in the, there's no ego. There's no ego to, uh, to fear because it, it gets bathed and washed away, you know, in the light. So when you have your, these scenes flashing before you, it's almost like Jesus is just like reconfiguring and he's showing you like in some way a life review, uh, like people do when they do go through a transition, they go through like a life review, but, but it's like a reinterpretation, you know, towards the fullness, like, like everything was working together for the good, nothing went wrong. Everything was in perfect order. Everything was in divine grace. Everything had its perfect place. And then we feel the, the sense of wholeness, like, wow, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jesus, for, for carrying me through to this state of mind. So it's beautiful. This is, this is why we do these gatherings. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that's it. It's, uh, Somehow this, this is all about shame. This is about guilt and shame. And it's like, and it's like, if I, because I have this sense of, I mean, I think that's why I'm so, I'm getting so clear on sort of all or nothing, you know, because I really do feel like, oh, every breath I've taken has been murder. Do you know what I mean? And so then to have a husband to have people that you love. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, okay, I don't know. I just, I'm like, wow, what, what is, somewhere in there there's this shame and I can't like, this guilt and this thing of like, I don't know, maybe you, even mm -hmm. that inclination to throw the baby with the bath water is just anger. And just like, oh, and not wanting to see what I made. Yeah, it's, it is a reinterpretation because when the mind fell asleep and believed that the body was its reality and its home, then that's where the, the anger and the guilt and the shame come in because the, the mind is, is still lit up. It's still the Christ mind. But one of the things that, that is, is that we associated communication with the body, with, with seeing, touching, feeling. You know, we we've went into this whole distortion of communication, when really we have perfect communication in heaven, and we have perfect communion in the light, and nothing of these body inventions never was needed at all to improve upon perfection. So I find that what happens when people pass away, that when people go through grief or f anger or different kind of emotions, it's still just a, a, a definition in the mind of communication. So like sometimes people will tell me, you know, I, my husband died or my sister died or my brother and I never got to tell them how much I love them. And I said, well, do it now. And they, what do you mean? They're gone. I said, oh no, you may think they're gone, but <laughs> they aren't gone. <laughs> Just like when somebody goes into a coma, you know, sometimes people assume if they're in a hospital bed and they're in a coma that they can't hear you. And so they say, well, you know, they were unconscious. And so what could I do? I said, Tell them anyway, you know, that it's, it's, communication is not limited to the body. Uh, and that's just part of the human condition is to believe it is. So um, I know with my father, uh, my biological father, he was so angry for so many years. I was saying earlier, you know, you tell me, you know, good, dirty, rotten bum, get a job. By the end of his life, we were so in love and he even, I was traveling, teaching the course, and he was, 
he was in intensive care when I got back to Cincinnati and he was in a, a coma. He was unconscious. And they took me into the emergency room and as soon as I went in the emergency room, he came right out of his coma. He's like, Dave! <laughs> I'm like, oh boy. The ego really tries to you know, make, a, make a big drama and then he, he jumped right out of his coma to, to talk to me. Where are, you, where are you going? Where are you teaching next? And we had this great talk. But the thing about it is, I started to really realize that, that communication is unlimited. You can, you can talk to your nephew, you can talk to your, your husband, you can talk just as well as you could as if there was a body there. Because the people that we seem to see in this world were just opportunities for us to, to see past the form, to see the love, to see the light, and to really see with a higher vision. That's what Jesus has been calling us to, is a higher vision. A truer vision, it's, you know, it's a, a, a real vision compared to the body's eyes. You know, they're, the body is so dense, you know, it's, it's, just, it's, so, uh, it's so slow, it's vibrating so slow. To think that, that something that's vibrating so slow is necessary for communication is a mistake. So, to me, that's what's happened to me. Little by little, I started to be convinced by just letting the love pour through, like, oh yeah, this is good, this, this feels whole and complete, this feels, this is lifting me up, this is showing me really how to communicate. And, and that's the attitude we have to have, it's just every day you wake up and just say, Jesus, show me, just show me. You keep leading the way, that's all you have to do. There's, there's nothing more than that required, because we're being so lifted up. I had a conversation um, today where I was doing a video conversation and all of a sudden we, I was talking, we got so quiet and it was like the presence of Jesus just came and descended on us in such a strong way, it was such a huge loving presence and, and, and then our words had to stop. I mean, <laughs> we, we, were, we were speechless speechless in that presence, you know? And that's all you're doing. You're just, every day you're just calling on that, you know, calling on that. And trusting, you know, that there's, there's a purification going on. And that's, that's what you've been praying for all along. That's what all of us are praying for. So, so thank you for just being so transparent. You are so transparent for all of us. And we can see it, we can see it in your face. We can see it in your, your rocking motion. We can feel your love and your devotion, you know. You're, you're more than a jazz singer. You're jazzing it up for Jesus now here. Uh, so, <laughs> we're, we're right with you. We're right with you. <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> Thanks, Patrice. It's beautiful. I'm going to go to Robert next over at the monastery. Yeah, this this movie, it's it was just like an emotional flush for me. Um, it's just <coughs> just everything. I mean, uh, those hospital scenes, you know, the whole symbology of losing a loved one, it brought me right back to my mother who passed away. And it brought me back to my own hospital scenes. And it was just like, Oh, so much was coming up. I, I didn't even know I had this grief left. I thought Jesus took care of it. And then it's all of a sudden, it's like, man, where did all this come from? Oof. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it's just, I mean, the whole deeper message of uh, just not looking for answers in form. I mean, this character played by Hugh Jackman, he was just going crazy, just doing everything just to find the answer in form. And I mean, it's, it just wasn't there. And I mean, it's, there, there's so many ways that I can think about that, you know, and what I'm doing right now, my uh, role as a steward, it really makes me question. Uh, I, I don't, it's, it's I, I'm not trying to look for problems to solve, but when I see like a mess laying around, you know, I speak to it. And it's just, it, it, it's just 
an interesting dynamic. It's not about finding problems. It's not about solving problems. It's just about, I guess it's about speaking to it so I don't repress it. Just my own mind is why I'm doing it for. And I mean, let's see here. I wrote, I wrote all this stuff down. Um, like with the, uh, with my mother, um, it, it kind of reminds me of something going back to Gary Renard, uh, when Arden and Persa had shared a lifetime together and then Persa passed away. And I guess, according to Gary, Arden's one last lesson to learn before he woke up was that it's impossible for bodies to be separated. And, uh, and then, you know, hearing you talk about it, what you're saying that, I mean, you know, my mother can hear everything that I'm saying right now. And it's, it's, it doesn't matter that her body's not here. I mean, that. <laughs> That's, it's it's just it's very deep for me. It's just you know it's, it's so 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 many. Um, I, I'm going to be digesting this movie for a while. I really am. There's so much symbology. There's so much symbology. I'm still trying to. I almost feel guilty because I'm trying to interpret it. <laughs> it's like why don't I just know the answer? <laughs> but I mean, just at at the end. I mean, when he was going towards the tree of life and he uh, faced off against that warrior that I guess he projected part of his mind. And, you know, the warrior uh, came at him and it looked like he killed him with his sword. And then his body died, but I guess, I guess you would call it his ascended body rose up. And I guess that was like a symbol of the higher self. And then the warrior bowed before it and asked for forgiveness. And then he went on to the tree of life and I mean, it's kind of like, again, you know, just forget the form. The form is not it. Like you said, we're, these when he emerged, when he uh, put that sap in his wound and his the leaves came out and you said, that's just a, a, what, a emergence of consciousness. I mean, the body is not our home. The leaves are not our home. This world is not our home. You know, it, it's just, it's, it's so wonderful to hear these concepts and actually be able to understand them. <laughs> I mean, you know as much as possible for me right now yeah but, that's great yeah but i you know i just you know i love you and i mean i thank you for showing these powerful movies and for all your commentary it's really really wonderful i'm blessed to have this opportunity oh beautiful beautiful it, it's wonderful that we have these great teaching tools uh, when I came over tonight i was just so happy when i came in the room and i was just sharing with the group here uh, about Izzy, you know, the name Izzy representing our isness, and uh, then Tommy representing uh, the Apostle Thomas, which is sometimes is called Doubting Thomas. <laughs> so Tommy representing Doubting Thomas, the egoic part. But the thing that got me too is I remembered Jesus had said to Thomas, after Jesus seemed to be crucified, he was put into the sepulcher, I have to say that word, I like sepulcher, uh, into the sepulcher, the tomb, the, the, stock, the rock was rolled, when the rock, stone was rolled away and he came out, he reappeared to Mary Magdala, to the apostles, and when he reappeared to the apostles, uh, Thomas, uh, doubting Thomas, came up to him and, and had to stick his finger in the hole. <laughs> Where the where the nail had been in Jesus's uh, arm, and uh, the funny thing was that what Jesus said to him was, um, "Blessed are those who have seen, and who believe. Far greater blessed are those who have not seen, and who believe." So even when Jesus shows up with the resurrected body, so to speak, um, he's still teaching. He's still flinging his seeds. <laughs> He's still, he's, he's not dead. He's still teaching the apostles, even with a new, a different resurrected body, you know, using the hole in, in, the, in the arm to teach about faith. You know, he was really teaching that have faith. Please have faith in the things I'm teaching you about, about communication, about, about approaching the light, about not hiding things and protecting things. And, and it's beautiful, even in the, with the role of steward, how you're able to, to speak up and speak things 
uh, is a demonstration of not hiding and repressing and still having to let go of the form, which we've talked about on other Wednesdays. Because none of us are used to that, right? You know, we're, we grow up and we, we hear, it's important what you say, it's important what you do, and it's important what other people say and do. <laughs> you see how they tack that on. And it doesn't help us to see we're dreaming if we're always concerned what did they say? Did they, what did they do? Did they like it? Are they upset? You know, we're, the ego's got us so focused on externals that it doesn't want us to be intuitive. It doesn't want us to listen to the Holy Spirit. It doesn't want us to shine our light. So you're, this is a big thing for you to be there at the monastery and to, to be taking on what you've taken on for the purpose of speaking up what you need to speak up and uh, and washing away any kind of doubts or fears about that. So thank you for for everything and I love you and I'm, I'm so glad we're on this journey together and yeah, I, I, I remember you, you so much wanted to be part of the community, you would write to me and write to me and, and then your your Jesus is like okay, <laughs> Robert, <laughs> you can you can use this uh, symbol for your healing, and you're doing a wonderful job of it. So we're so grateful to have you part of it all. Thank you. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Monastery. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's all lit up. Right. Okay, I'm going to go to Javier next. Go ahead, Javier, you can unmute yourself. Ready? Yeah, we hear you. <laughs> hey, I, David, I love you. <laughs> I love you, Robert and Lynn, <laughs> everyone from the monastery. Um, well, I just came from the monastery three weeks ago, and I've been living some experience. And... Um, one of the experiences that I lived this past weekend is that um, I got invited to a retreat from my uh, Christian church. I used to be a co-pastor, and I left church. And for almost four years, I felt so much guilt that um, because I left church, and I thought that God didn't love me, and God was mad at me, and... I was mad at God as well. So up in the monastery, I had that connection with God again. And and um, and I just want to tell this because it's, I've been living so many experiences since I came of forgiveness. And when, I, when they invite me to this retreat a week before, I said, no. <laughs> Uh, and then I told my wife, like, I don't need to go to a retreat. I just came from the monastery. Like, I don't, I don't need that, you know. But then the same day that they were going to start the, the, uh, the retreat, God woke me up at 3 o'clock. And I just heard his voice saying, you have to go. And I did. I listened. I left everything. And I put everything in God's hand. And I left to the retreat. So when I was at the retreat, I was feeling so much peace, so much peace. I was thinking about the monastery and and and, um, and then the second, it was a three day retreat. The second day, uh, Friday night, we were praying, we were all praying, and then I just felt like like the sky opened and something came to me, and then I felt like. This, I don't know how to explain it, but I felt this beautiful, beautiful thing in my heart. And then I got on my knees and I started crying and crying. And I was the only, it was a man's retreat. I was the only one crying. I was the only one in, in, on my knees. And then when I woke, when I stand up, I had this feeling that I have to go and ask my pastor for forgiveness. But at the same time, I was fighting because I was thinking, like, I never did anything wrong, you know. And but I still, I, st I, I still feel that I needed to go and and ask for forgiveness. So 
uh, I went and I hugged him and we started crying and I told him, I'm sorry if I even hurt, if I ever hurt you, like, forgive me. Like, I'm sorry. And then he asked me, he goes, he was crying too. And then he said, can you do me a favor? And I said, sure, sure, whatever. You know, we were both mm-hmm. hugged, crying. And then he said, can you ask all the men from church for forgiveness? And I was like, but I didn't do anything to them. And, but I still did it. And I, you know, I was crying and I told him like, hey, I'm sorry if I hurt you. I'm sorry for leaving church. I'm sorry for this. I'm sorry for that. And then all these things started coming to my mind, you know, all the things that they were in my heart or my mind. So, and then every man start at, um, you know, they start uh, doing the same thing to the pastor, to other um, members of the church, you know, oh, I want to ask for forgiveness for this, 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 and that. So it was a, it was a nice time. <laughs> <laughs> and so I came, then I came, um, I came from that retreat on, on Sunday. And since that day, um, like if a person comes to my mind, I've been calling them and I've been asking them for forgiveness. Like, I don't know. I'm just telling them if I did something to you, if I hurt you, just forgive me. You know, I never try to do anything wrong. And then I feel this peace, you know, when I came from the retreat, I felt this peace. So yesterday uh, I was working and, and I have to, I left work because uh, I started feeling sick. I started feeling like my, my blood pressure was high. I, was, I started feeling like I was going to um, faint. And, and um, so I just came home and I laid down and I wasn't feeling good. And I stayed in bed almost um, to the whole, whole afternoon, the whole night. But this morning at 4 o'clock, a dream woke me up. And I was dreaming about um, that I, I went to my old house and my mom was with my dad up in the stairs and my dad passed away uh, a year ago and then and then I asked my mom what's wrong with my dad and 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 she said he's sick and I go oh he might he, he might be drinking again and then and then she said no no he hasn't been drinking he feels sick and he had cancer you know so and I, and I felt bad I felt so bad in the dream I felt so bad, and then I wanted to go and see my dad, but I couldn't see him because, he, like, the door was like going this way, and then the room was facing to the other, the other way. So I couldn't see him. So I woke up this morning. And I was crying. I was crying, like, 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 um, like I feel so much guilt, and then I was feeling so sick of my stomach again, you know, I was, I wasn't feeling good, but I needed to be on some place at eight o'clock this, uh, today. So I went to this place. I was sweating. I was feeling bad. And then I finished, I finished the work. I came back home and then I was just sitting, just sitting in my living room and just thinking about everything. And I couldn't understand of what was going on. So then I was like, I know what I have. It's emotional. Like, I know. I was telling myself. So then I left because I had a a 3 o'clock appointment. And I was driving, David. And and my dad came to my mind. And I started crying when I was driving. And I was, and and I think I had, like, I, I had a good relationship with my dad. I always tell my dad, I love you. I always took care of my dad. I never, never did anything to my dad. Like, I thought that I wasn't, that I was a good son. Right? So then I said, like, dad, if I did anything to you, like, forgive me. And then I, I was having my hand like this. And then when I opened it, uh, um, uh, a white hair was in my hand and I mean I don't even have hair 
And, I'm, <laughs> and I was like, I know it's my dad. I know it's my dad. So I started crying, but I was, it was joy. And everything, like everything, like what I was feeling, everything was gone in seconds. Like, and I, and I, what I got from that, it was like, my dad is not mad at me or nothing. You know, the guilt is like in my mind. I, I never did anything wrong to my dad. So then, um, and then I was watching the movie and, and when I was up in the monastery, Lynn told me about this movie and I started watching it. And then she asked me, hey, did you watch the movie? And I was like, no, it was weird. Like, I didn't understand. So I left it like halfway. So right now, me and my wife, we were watching the movie. And I was like, oh, I already watched the movie. So I was listening to your, your commentary. And then I was like, uh, try to do something else, you know. And then, um, and then at the end, you know, I started watching the movie. And then I was just laying down in bed. And then when when that girl gave him the seed and he opened he I was I jumped and I was like, that's what happened to me today. Like that that's what happened. Like I know it was my dad, I know. Like and I was telling my wife, like, should I tell that? Should I say that? Like what does it mean? Like what I don't know. I don't know. It was just weird that that happened to me today. And then watching the movie, I was like, oh, my God, it's not a consequence, not a, a coincidence, a, a coincidence, coincidence, yeah. So, um, I don't know, it's just, uh, <laughs> it, it's just <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. We can feel it. We're going through it with you. Just to, that's Because that, it's not about trying to analyze the words. When Jesus gives you the words to say, it's like, he knows the perfect thing, and it, it sounds like just by your willingness to follow, it was like a ripple effect. Like it, it, it transferred from you to your pastor to all the people there, and that's all that Jesus wants us to do: is all feel good, feel innocent, feel happy. So and we can't even judge the words. You know, we're just supposed. To, okay, you tell me what. To, I'm three, three in the morning, four in the morning. I'm supposed to go. Okay. I'm going, uh, say this, okay, I'll do it. It's just that willingness to keep saying yes to, to following and not trying to judge or analyze anything. Because it's, you know, it, it is kind of a curious thing that, that we're in a position of mind where we believe that things happened to us or against us. And Jesus is laughing, saying, <laughs> you have no idea. You're, you're not asked to forgive what happened or what ac actually was done. You're asked to, to come inside with me and, and feel the innocence, that everyone's innocent, that nobody, you know, nobody ever really did those things because those were part of the projection. You're, you know, you're coming inside to the love. But I love how you just followed, just like a true servant. And now you are the church. You're bringing that church Wherever you go, the church goes with you, you know. And that's great to feel that too, because otherwise, you know, it's like some feeling that some, you know, that you left something behind or abandoned something. No, that's all washed away too. So thank you. Thank you for being the light of the world. <laughs> we see it on your face. <laughs> it's beautiful. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to Peter next. Peter, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Peter. Hi, here you go. I can't actually see Dave, but that's all right. Yeah, there um, I'll see. Oh, there you are. How are you going? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't actually think I'd get on because I put my hand up rather late, but um, yeah, I've got a sort of a questions regarding people pleasing and. Um, responsibility which you talked about and maybe the whole relationship as well so I might struggle through this a bit but I'll see how I go. Uh, you mentioned earlier on about the matrix you were talking about how Neo had a decision at one stage where there was two doors he could pick either um, to go with the source or back to Trinity um, so he felt pulled in I think he ended up choosing Trinity to go back because he felt that responsibility to go back and he didn't choose Source. 
So my question sort of to do with that, but I might give a bit of background first with my question and then I'll, I'll lead to that. Um, probably about four years ago, I was in a relationship for about 20 years and I split up. And then about two years after that, she found another partner and we both had the kids sort of 50-50. But she got very um, sort of emotionally abusive with the girls, I guess. And I ended up making the decision to take the children away and not give them back. And of course, it got very nasty. This was about two years ago, it got very nasty. And looking at going to court and all these sort of things. And it was an absolutely horrible time in my life. And then I sort of made the decision in the end not to go to court, but just to uh, let it ride out and see what happened. Basically turn it over to spirit, really. And because the outcome with court was just was not good. No matter, even the best outcome was not good. But it was weird how it changed because by just handing it over and letting it go, she gradually said I could have one child then the other child. And it just, the best outcome come of that over a period of time. But the partner, so I ended up getting the girls and she ended up moving away. But she's with her partner and he was quite, quite abusive. And their relationship ended probably mm, about three or four months ago. And as I said, he was quite abusive. And But the role of my ex-partner has sort of been turning full circle. So we've sort of been in contact a lot and sort of developing to what I think is more of a holy relationship now. Um, we've had discussions on the phone and being very open and honest with her and she's been with her as well. But she returned back to my where I live yesterday, actually. She's moving back into her house. But she was quite worried about her partner. And when she got back to her house, there was, because she had been renting it out, she got back yesterday, she'd come back to this town. He had done stuff, he'd gone to the house and he'd done stuff in the backyard and written horrible stuff about her, he put glue on all the locks and um, she is very frightened. So she came here yesterday and I could see she was scared to go back there. And I didn't really want her, she asked earlier on, could she move back into the house when she come back to the bay with me and the girls? I just didn't think that was a good idea. But yesterday, I sort of felt sorry for her, but in the end, I said, like, you can stay here last night because I didn't want to go back to that situation. And she's gone off again today to try and sort stuff out and that sort of thing. But I sort of feel guided to let her stay here now. Um, just... I guess I did the, the um, Take Me Home retreat probably two months ago. And ever since that retreat, my life's just changed. I've been in the course of about 30 years and I've basically got nowhere with it. But since that retreat, my life's just just turned. I had amazing changes after that retreat as well. So, yeah, I guess my question is, because I've always been a people pleaser as well. and But I, I don't think I'm doing that. I just feel guided in a way to open the door to her um, but I'm a bit worried that I am maybe still pleasing a bit but I don't, I don't think I am at all that I just feel guided to sort of help her and just take that day by day I'm just wondering to get your reflection on that David and what your thoughts are on that especially talking about responsibility and why being like I, I don't want to get sucked in again but I, I don't feel I am at all though I'm still I'm feeling quite guided so yeah Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, that's the way the miracle seems to, to work, is that you, like with that Take Me Home retreat, you, you can have these miracles and insights, and then, yeah, the li your life seems to change, the world looks differently, the, the reactions of the people. I mean, you, you, it's almost like you open your heart up in a beautiful way, and then you start really calling in these reflections. And the ego can be a bit suspicious uh, around this because they're so loving. And, and yet, it's, it's kind of a great approach to say, just to take it moment by moment, day by day. You know, the ego will sometimes say, now don't fall back into this pattern, or don't fall back into this trap, and so on and so forth. But I think it's just beautiful to just wake up every day 
in that place of I'm okay. I'm here to be truly helpful. I'm I'm going to heal as I learn how to teach healing. I'm going to trust and follow day by day and 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 stay with what feels really good in your heart. You know because that's part of stepping into being like a miracle worker. You know that that was your whole function. The preordained for you in this world was to be a miracle worker, and and as you start to do that more and more and more, it it does grow stronger and stronger. That's very very natural, and also with it, it's kind of like with your with your wife and her ex partner and everything. You do. It's kind of like with Robert, where Robert has to say what he sees and says what he you know what comes through him, but then. It, you're responsible for your state of mind. You're responsible for the for the happiness that comes into your life when you listen and follow the Holy Spirit. And then, in in terms of people, you you don't have to kind of feel like you have to intercede for them or or uh, watch out for them. You know, it's part of that handing it over to the Spirit as you do what you feel really resonates in your heart and what feels really expansive and helpful for you, that's your responsibility. You know, that's that's your connection with spirit. And then, in one sense, you let the chips fall where they may. You let the spirit arrange things. Uh, I, I sometimes would pray, make it obvious. If, if I'm to say or do something here, uh, be helpful, just make it obvious. Um, whether whether it's uh, waking up from a dream like we just heard, or it's a strong feeling that comes in, but you're not responsible for people's choices or their lives or how things go, but you are responsible for just lining up in your purpose and letting that that light and that love come through you, and that's that's where where to keep your focus. That keeps it away from um, you know. Sometimes the ego likes to slip into, it's almost like a codependency of like starting to, to try to intervene in uh, people's lives in some way. And you're just coming from what feels re resonant to you. And as this new awareness is coming in, it's so amazing. Just stay with that and then realize that that handles everything. You know, it's it's not a an equation where you have to kind of figure it out for now for your your ex wife or her partner or how their relationship. You know, you're you're just coming from letting the miracles come through you, and and then you know it will work out. It sounds like already she's she's uh, off sorting some things out today. So that's that's a beautiful uh, reflection too. You're just about your business and your miracle business, and she's she's you know moving forward with that too. Yeah, um, ever since that uh, take me home retreat, like this miracle after miracle every day, and but I'm in a state now where I feel at peace. So if this happened prior to that, I would have been in fear, but I just feel guided as this is going to undo me more as well. I just stay in that place of peace and I don't get sucked into it and I'm just just happy and helping her but staying on that guided by spirit in, in that space. I just feel that day to day now and um I just I don't feel fear about it at all. I'm just mm. letting it unfold sort of thing. So and it just feels natural. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. We're right there with you. That's beautiful. Okay, well, we've got three hands left, David. So I don't know if you how you how are you feeling to yeah. keep going. Then? Yeah, well, let's let's do these last three. That's fantastic. Okay, we'll go to Susan next. Okay. Go ahead, Susan. Hi. Hi, Susan. Hi. There you are. Hi. You know, I just had to come on and say yes to saying thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for giving and giving and giving. I mean, in this night alone, I'm, I'm just, again, blown away. I just can't even imagine how phenomenal this night was. 
I've never seen the movie. I never read the novel. I know it's on, you know, the Miracle Watcher's Guide, I, but I never watched it. And um, it was perfect. Absolutely perfect. I don't know if you're there with the writers and directors, like whispering in their ears what the movie is. <laughs> You know, it's like your presence is so there and how you come in. I'm just so grateful. You know, grateful, grateful. I mean, I took all these notes and I feel like we went through the whole course. You know, from the very beginning, the entire course of miracles we went through tonight. With this movie, with your commentary, there was nothing left out. And even the beginning of the film, I just wrote down these few words because it was in the movie, Genesis, let us finish it. Perhaps it's a trick. We break through, and then there was talk about the tree of life and the circle. So I'm like, my God, you've given it all. <laughs> you know, there's the movie, but the commentary was all there. So I'm just so grateful. And I, have to, I know it's almost midnight here, so I'll be quick. But 24 hours ago, right now, um, I allowed, I mean, I've been feeling happier and happier. And like Peter said, just trusting more and more and just being, you know, really in joy. And even going to New Jersey and being in joy and coming back. Although I did miss last week being with you here, you know, for the movie. But last night, I had a little concern about my daughter, who I've talked about with you before. So I call, I never call her late at night. It's like, I know not to do that. But I was, I had a little fear. So, I, oh, and rather than pause and, you know, hand it over to spirit as I usually would do, I called her. And within 20 minutes, you know, the way you were expressing about your dad, she was expressing all of her anger. I mean, within 20 minutes, I never played the role of the mother. I was not a good mother, you know. And I'm just like, oh, I was just checking in. But the ego, you know, I just, it's my own mind. I have to pull it back in my mind. But um, I do have that desire for that healing, for that merge, you know, for that, because she knows I love her. And, you know, in a few days, I may hear from her again, just saying, I love you. And this is the one who, you know, she got herself a PhD in psychology, but she's not practicing. She could care less. You know, she's working at a CVS. She, she may never pick it up because she was trying to heal her mind in a way that her mother wasn't doing, which was the course. So it's all fascinating. Um, all these notes. <laughs> I, I am praying. I, I continue to pray to have the Holy Spirit reinterpret this in a relationship. And I hand her over the form I hand over. You know, I think um, a few weeks ago in the last conversation I had, I thanked her. I don't know if she heard me, but I actually thanked her for triggering any unconscious guilt in my mind so that I can, you know, heal that. And then it was like a miracle. All these memories came through that were happy and we were laughing, but it wasn't the case last night. So just about 24 hours ago. <laughs> mm. Yeah, but now I'm back to full joy. I mean, how could you not? <laughs> you know, I just feel humble and grateful and beyond words, you know, grateful to be yeah. here. Oh, beautiful. Well, I said it would be mind blowing. You know, I could feel it on my way over, driving over here. I was like, oh, here we go tonight. It's going to be a lively one tonight. And that's it. It's supposed to, it's all, the whole thing comes for us. We're so loved. <laughs> Thank you. I'll go to Stephen next. Hey, all right. Um, thank you. This is um, fantastic. Like, again, I wrote down... It was, um, and thanks for the invitation for coming to uh, take a walk with you. Um, I, I, I love that theme and, and what came to me was, was, it was another wonderful Wednesday winter walk of awakening. And um, boy, what, what, what great, so many symbols to play with here and, and, and pull my mind and attention into 
the holiness. And I just saw the queen and, and Izzy, as you set it up, uh, um, symbols of, of, of the Holy Spirit. And, and I loved how the queen, the, she was that, that, that voice in his mind, I'll call him Bubble Man, but I was also pulling up the lyrics to Rocket Man, and we've just had a continuation here of Mr. Nobody and, um, and, and Rocket Man, and, and um, it, it happened to you prior to that, and just this, this continuation of this cleansing and this theme. But the lyrics of Rocket Man, it, I, I couldn't get it out of my head as, as, as Bubble Man was, uh, was hearing the voice that said, all these years... He, he was talking, he says, all these years, all these memories, there's always been you. You've pulled me through time. And I thought, boy, is that not the truth? That's the Holy Spirit pulling and using memory to pull us through time, pull us um, back into our mind and to my mind and wake up and to realize there's that joy, there's that happiness, there's just the thought away. And when I was thinking about the lyrics of Rocket Man, and we all know the lyrics, but it says, and, the, and I think it's going to be a long, long time. Till touchdown brings me round again to find I'm not the man I think I am at home. Oh, no, no, no. I'm a rocket man. Rocket man burning out his fuse up here alone. So I was, that, that song was playing in my mind as he's ascending into his release of time and as he's marking time and our, and our whole fixation and addiction to time and all these beautiful themes. And then how, how she, um, as the queen, when she was having a meal and she was saying, no, we're not going to go kill the inquisitor. And I thought, well, that's the, that's the ego. That's the question. And so she had the answer and she knew where the answer was to, to, to rid the kingdom to Spain of this darkness. And I saw Spain as the mine, but she said, salvation is in the jungles of new Spain. And, and just at that time, she's telling him that where salvation is, she's rubbing his forehead or she's just lifting up his forehead. She's touching his forehead. And boy, I just thought there's a clear hit where salvation is. And we travel, but in dreams. And it just made so much, it, it, it just brought me right back into that um, vertical uh, awareness of, of where, the, where the truth is and, and where the salvation is. It's in the jungles of our, of our thinking, of my mind. But that was, um, that was so good. And I, uh, Dave, I love your, your, your um, gap, the gap of guilt. Um, boy, that's just really a great phrasing on that. And then I thought of the... Um, that the, the, the gap of guilt is really the troubled waters. And then the Holy Spirit is the bridge over the troubled waters. If to, to, to use this song and get into the gap and just the link, it, it's the Holy Spirit. That's that link. That's that thought. It's just the thought away. And this, this just had, had so many treasures um, in it for me. One thing that came up was, was you're talking about the distractions, that, that the inevitable distractions. And there's a great, great commercial by Geico called the oldest trick in the book. And I think this is a masterpiece of a commercial. So, so if you haven't seen it or anybody that hasn't seen it, go look up Geico, oldest trick in the book. It's just a masterpiece teaching, but it, it's, it's, it's about distraction. And it's just about the oldest trick in the book was look as thou over there. And then you just have to go see it for yourself. But uh, thank you so much. There's so much good stuff here and I'll keep it short tonight. But this was, um, had so many comments I wanted to share last week about Rocket Man and the week before about it could happen to you. All these things really just come back to this present moment and, 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 the, and the queen saying, will you deliver Spain from bondage? That's, that's the only question, really. Are you, is, let it, yes, yes. So thank you. This is wonderful time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Okay, I'll go to Kristen last. Hi, uh, Kristen. You can unmute yourself. Hi, thank you, Eric. Hi, David. Hi, everyone. Hi, Kristen. Let me get you on my screen. There we go. Um, I don't know what I can add to everyone's sharing. I feel like nothing at this point. Um, thank you so much for your commentary, and I feel so full to quote Izzy. Um, I feel such beauty in the overlapping timelines that are even fiction and nonfiction. You know, there's just such a beautiful combination of the way time is not what we think and fiction and nonfiction, there's no boundary between the two. And 
um, as Stephen and Susan said, so many lines to me felt like the course was being spoken directly to me. There was that moment where Izzy is the queen and she's talking to the conquistador and um, she says, there is hope, father. And it was the entrance of the father, but of course, that is our hope. That is the hope. And the way she just continued to say, like Stephen was suggesting, um, Spain desires it above all else. So this, this, it's pointing to what we need to desire above all else, the eternal, the memory that's been, she says, not lost, hidden. And so it's just so beautifully um, guiding. It's like she as the part of the split mind that is the spirit is, is guiding it all out. Even I felt so moved when um, Tommy comes into the, the bed in the hospital and he says, I'm sorry. And there's so much guilt. He hasn't been there. She, he's not saving her. And she says something like, for what? You know, and again, it's the spirit, like there's, there's no guilt, there's nothing, like you often say, you didn't do anything wrong and you didn't do anything right, you can't. And that beautiful invitation that, that begins the story, which is her invitation to go out into the snow. And like you mentioned, the, the moment he has the epiphany about the healing the tree and the healing and he looks up and he sees the light and it's not just the light it's all the snow falling and accumulating around that light and then it becomes this misdirected miracle impulse to go back into form instead of it's for the invitation out and I just so completely identify with that like this this hint of light and then the fear comes and it's immediately directed back into the world instead of continuing you know to go and then all of your symbols with the the ring too were so beautiful because I could feel at the end when he puts on that ring, it's like truly letting go of special relationship and choosing holy relationship because he even lets go of the tree. He leaves the tree behind, which is her, what she has become, what he's trying to keep alive to save it. And then he his little bubble, he's like leaving the world. He's just willing to completely go into holy relationship with the light. And that's just fullness. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. It, it's beautiful from that fullness too, like when, when she's out on the roof and her bare feet are in the snow and he's a bit shocked and, you know, we need to get you inside and then then shortly after that, you know, she's in the bathtub, a steaming bathtub, and and uh, she doesn't feel the heat, and and it scares him. It scares him, uh, like that she's not feeling the uh, the cold or the heat. But she just pulls him right into the tub. Uh, that's the graciousness. That's the fullness. It's like it it knows that that there's a call for love there, and and it it. It's, that's what I like about the Spirit. It just, it's always inviting us, pulling us in more. Even the things that, that are not understood, uh, it, it has this big welcome invitation, like, yeah, just keep, it's okay, it's all right, just keep coming. And uh, so it was, it was beautiful to watch that dynamic kind of play through the movie with him and her, and um, that's the welcome of the Spirit. It's just really strong. So thank you for catching those and pointing those little things out, those little nuances, because that's, that's it. We, we start to feel more open and more in miracle-minded, and then we start to notice more things, just little by little. The little evidence starts to come through to us, and that's, yeah, it's just so beautiful. So thank you, Kristen. Thank you. What a beautiful movie. Okay, well, I think we've done it. Another 
great, great, great movie gathering. <laughs> and uh, we just never know, but thank you for participating in the polls and and uh, putting down your movie ideas and then, uh, yeah, it's a lot of prayer that goes into it, but wow, when we all come together, we just have these great experiences together. It's like Jesus has taken us to the movies and showing us in whatever way we can we can receive it. So, so from New Spain, <laughs> we bid you a happy evening, or in, in the case of Peter, maybe morning or wherever you are. Uh, we send you all of our love, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. <laughs>